Hey, this is David Rovix with another episode of Discussions with David. And um, rather than uh, actually giving you my own introduction of today's guest, I just want to uh, talk to Matthew and and let his story unfold as we go, because I think that would be much more interesting. And uh, <laughs> Hopefully, right? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> And Matthew and I have been touch, uh, been in touch uh, mostly by, by just by email, I guess, for many years. We 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 did meet briefly a, quite a long time ago now, uh, two thousand five, I guess it was. And <laughs> it's, um, it, it's been a minute. Yeah, it's been a minute, and and uh, in in the life of a somewhat younger man, it's even longer because you were in high school back then. I was already well into adulthood, <laughs> but um, but Matthew, what did you, you did you you grew up in Indiana? Did you? Well, I uh, ended up living for many years in Indiana. Um, I grew up in Maryland, a uh, small town called Poolsville that to this day still doesn't have a traffic light. Um, and and Poolsville is a very interesting place because it was a, a traditionally small, like Southern town. When you think of Maryland, you don't really think Southern. Um, but throughout my life, it's really changed into being one of the, uh, kind of like Northern Virginia, one of just the suburbs of DC as, as high rents and things like that forced more and more of the DC professionals out. So Poolsville was always kind of a weird place to grow up. Like people would show up uh, to my high school and hit a, their horn and Dixie would play. And then you've got the, the sons and daughters of, you know, engineers and lobbyists and stuff like that going to the same school. So it, it was an interesting place to grow up. And, and especially particularly interesting in terms of the years that you grew up there, because I assume that probably before your childhood, it was more, it was not so much a suburb of DC. It really was its own little Virginia town, right? And then it, it became more of a suburb of DC in the course of your lifetime? Yeah. Um, so the, the small little museum we have in, in Poolsville, uh, the town was called the most treasonous town in the entire South by the uh, union officer that was in charge of the garrison. Uh, and a lot of like the roads, like I grew up on one of the roads that was named for uh, a town father that was also a Confederate raider uh, back during the war. So that that's you know the history of 150 years ago, uh, and Poolsville was featured not so gloriously um, in the early 1950s in a Time magazine spread um, fighting integration. Um, and if you go to like the Civil Rights Museum, there's pictures from Poolsville, which you usually don't think small town Maryland. Uh, you think Mississippi or Alabama for those sorts of things. And a lot of those you know pictures of kids picketing the integrated school. Um, you know, we're older, obviously, um, by the time I grew up. And uh, so it definitely an old school Southern town that when I was born was kind of in flux and has been changing ever since. But th there was definitely kind of like a, a culture clash. Um, like when I when I was a kid, um, we were called the Poolsville Indians was our local town mascot. And there mm -hmm. was it, it was a huge fight. And that was actually like my introduction to any sort of politics uh, of, of race or anything like that, where uh, like the, the, the county came down on pools for having that name. And it was a big fight for years. I and mean, even when I went to high school, people would still show up to, to, you know, varsity basketball games and their Poolsville Indians jerseys that were at that point, 10 or 15 years old. So it, it, it was definitely interesting. It set me up for, for a lot of different, different inputs as, as I was growing up. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, Lots of different inputs there. And you actually, late, just to, I know I'm skipping ahead here, but you actually have a degree in history, incidentally. I mean, when you mentioned the Civil War and stuff, and, and uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, history. And so then w when all the yuppies started moving in and all the government workers and stuff, was, did this create, a, was this a real source of tension and did it cause uh, rents to go up and that sort of thing? Was it a big uh, issue for, for the folks that were more the, the original Poos villains? Poos villains? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, like my, um, uh, my grandparents had bought uh, 40 acres and a small farm outside of town uh, before I was born. Um, and, and they did a small amount of raising like hogs and chickens and things like that. And uh, that's, that's when Poolsville was more traditional. And now they're building developments right now when I, I went back to visit and they're, they're million dollar homes and things like that. So I know for myself, uh, due to my political trajectory, uh, I'm not in touch with a lot of people uh, I went to school with um, who disagreed with my views at the time, but um, I don't know anyone that I grew up with that still lives in Poolsville um, because they, they can't afford it. And Montgomery County in general, um, it's a very weird place because where I lived was in part of what was known as the agricultural reserve. So they couldn't f to build all the infill um, of the places to the other part of the county. But even so, uh, rents 
have gone up. Mortgages have gone up, building condos next to the elementary school. That was a, a small horse farm when I was a kid. Uh, now they've got, you know, $400,000 condos. So I don't, I don't honestly know anyone that I grew up with or was, you know, ahead of me in school or behind me in school that still lives there because they, they, they just can't afford it, you know? Yep. <clears throat> Sounds very much like the town I grew up in, incidentally. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I mean, in, in, in that sense, in that mm-hmm. sense. But um, then I, this is a question I actually wouldn't necessarily ask of a lot of people, but given that you have a degree in history, <laughs> tell me about your family history and like your, your parents, but also I, I imagine given that you have a degree in history, you probably know more about the, your family background going further back. And I think that's always interesting to ask people who actually know what to say. <laughs> like, oh, I'm not sure. My grandpa was Irish. I don't know where, you know, but like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, unfortunately for uh, the members of my family, uh, the Heimbach clan uh, from Germany, um, not very many of us came over, and most of them settled in Pennsylvania, uh, where my dad's from, and around the Reading area. So, so I do feel bad for all the Heimbachs that you know it's not like my last name was Smith. You know, Smith pops up in the news, and that could be that could be anyone. When Heimbach pops up, it, it's not a very uh, common name. Um, but yeah, my family came uh, from Germany on my dad's side. Um, uh, my mom's side is uh, is Irish uh, with a little bit of English, and uh, they've been here since since dirt essentially. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, originally in, in parts of North Carolina, um, where, where my ancestors, uh, for the most part, uh, you know, were drafted and, and fought in the Civil War. And after everything was basically destroyed um, in Mox County and, and the surrounding areas, uh, some of them moved out to Iowa and others ended up in Maryland. And uh, you know, eventually my, my parents met. Uh, they were both teachers. Um, educated conservatives. My dad was a Lutheran. My mom was a Catholic. Um, and they ended up having me and my two siblings. So th- th- that was always kind of an interesting thing. Like I, I, w- I was raised with knowing kind of where I came from, um, not in any sort of, you know, people people always think like if you get involved in, in radical politics, like you must have been taught this. Like you must have been been raised in a way to, to you know, be a white nationalist. It must be your parents' fault or your grandparents' fault. And like it wasn't like my my family, you know. I, I remember back right when I was getting into your music uh, when the Iraq War had just started, and uh, I remember very clearly my grandfather sitting down saying he supported the Patriot Act because uh, you know President Bush knows what he's doing, and if you don't have anything to hide, like you know you should just support America. Race wasn't really talked about, um, just like conservative, kind of working up, you know, middle class sort of conservative. Christian upbringing. Um, that was, you know, we, we definitely didn't have a lot of money and maybe got to go on, you know, a long weekend to the beach, you know, once a year or something like that, but um, definitely not like traumatic or anything. <laughs> as, as people usually assume, um, you know, I've been asked over the years many times and it's like, no, my <laughs> I grew up in a, a pretty quote unquote normal, normal upbringing. Normal, but on the conservative and religious uh, side of normal. Yeah. Yeah, um, so th- so that's uh, kind of how I started getting into politics. Which you know, some uh, some teenagers teenagers get into heavy metal music. Others, uh, you know, start wearing uh, you know all black and stuff like that. And uh, I was just surrounded by like Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh, you know, go to church every Sunday sort of thing. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna read the Communist Manifesto. I'm gonna start <laughs> start reading anarchist stuff because like my uh, I remember it was a huge scandal. My uh, my uncle. Um, was dating a gal who eventually became my aunt, and uh, he uh, they, they had a, um, uh, a, a carry sticker on their car in 2004, and that was like a, a family scandal. Um, so I was like, you know, what what's the real way to push back against my parents? And uh, and then he ended up reading a bunch of communist stuff. <laughs> yeah, go, go much further to the left than carry, and then you got it. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> exactly. If, if this makes them upset, then this will be even better. Yeah. <laughs> There's some good teenage thinking. <laughs> so then you read the Communist Manifest, which is the most eloquent thing that Marx ever wrote. Everything else is so obtuse, but that one was really easy reading, you know. And Engels, I also thought was like a really, really good, uh, accessible writer, unlike Marx. But other people have done things with Marx that are more accessible than the original. <laughs> as far as, I, I always, I, I guess, I feel guilty still for not having read Das Kapital. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> Well, I, I tried when I was like 14 or 15, and I was like, I guess I'm just Good not far you. enough, you know? <laughs> no, neither are most of the adults. 
<laughs> the overwhelming majority. Yeah, the economists do pretty well with it, though. I guess they have to. It's <laughs> kind of required reading. You can't get a degree in economics without having getting, given that a, a good hack at it, right? I guess. I, I'm willing to bet a few of them have used the Spark Notes edition, though. To... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then you got into you got into politics and and you started out with with far left politics fair to uh -huh. say but then but then if you went looking for any actual people doing that kind of politics on the ground it's a lot harder to find in especially in suburban virginia than it is uh to find a good book in the library from marx right <laughs> Well, exactly. And so what ended up happening um, to kind of bring us into our first point of meeting is um, I had a, a friend of mine who, you know, he was liking these ideas and we were talking about them and stuff like that, thinking we uh, we'd solved all the problems in the world, uh, as most teenage boys, you know, think that they have everything figured out. Yeah. Um, but his sister was involved in um, like a democratic socialist group at the University of Maryland. Um, so I'd become familiar with your work, uh, along with like Phil Oakes, um, Pete Seeger, I mean, all the yeah, the, the traditional like left wing folk singers. Um, so we we went and got her to got her to drive us, and uh, I think that was during your Halliburton boardroom massacre tour, if memory serves yeah. me right. Sounds uh, right. <laughs> which um, I don't have the t shirt I bought anymore, but I had it for like ten years until it, it there was nothing left on it, um, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. But uh, that's when I got connected with um, kind of like college leftists, and I was really excited and I was really gung ho. And uh, one of the times, one of the guys, uh, older, just very like stereotypical kind of hippie college student on the left, and he was like, you need to read this book called Settlers. And I was like, okay, well, I, I read lots of books. I like books. Um, so I got it. And, you know, essentially the thesis of the book is that the white proletariat doesn't exist, like, at all. And white folks in general, like, are not so much part of a class struggle, um, like, we're almost like inherently bad. And I mean, it's, it's a very long book uh, and I'm sure we could do like a three hour like dissection of it. But so I'm like 15 at the time and I come back and I say like, you know, my parents, like I, I went to Catholic school for the first, you know, like three years of my schooling, but they couldn't afford it anymore. Um, so I went to public school. Like my mom had to go back into the workforce. We grew up in a very modest home. Like I didn't think I was part of the problem and I was here trying to be part of the solution. And they were like, well, you know, you're, your privilege and like you really don't have a you know you, did you read the book and i was like well i read the book but you're telling me like i i literally don't have a space here to solve these problems like the beginning of the war on terror or income inequality and stuff like that and i said well if you if you guys don't want me then i'm gonna go off and find somewhere where i can be on my own side and so about the time i turned like 16 17 that's when i i really started to dip into what you could call the far right like I'd like to say I made a really earnest effort to be on the left, and they were like, "Sorry, we're we're full." <laughs> they were like, "Sorry, we're only interested in identity politics, and we have no room for uh, the class war, and we have no class analysis." That includes the working, the white working class. Well, yeah, and you know, they were like, "Well, you, you know, are you LGBTQ?" And I was like, "Well, no, I'm I'm a straight white Christian teenager, but I still." I still care about these things that are happening in the world. And, you know, people are a little, a little less excited at that point. And that is what pushed me to where I was like, well, if, if I don't have a place here, I've got to, you know, I, I think most young, young people want to find a place. And like, you know, if you ever read the book Bowling Alone, you know, the analysis of the breakdown of American community, like whether you're a teenager or a grown adult, like the, the, the real sense of, of any sort of identity, community, uh, connection with other human beings, has just broken apart due to capitalism. So I was like, well, I'm going to find my place. And then you end up, you know, ordering Mein Kampf off, off Amazon and <laughs> it's off to the races. Mm -hmm. So Mein Kampf was uh, the next step. How did you, how did that work though? I mean, how did that, um, how did, like, what was the process that led you to Mein Kampf from, from meeting those uh, really annoying, privileged, middle-class <laughs> college students, pseudo leftists? <laughs> Well, I, I'd read in a, in a book about um, uh, the rise of the Third Reich, um, and, uh, and Joseph Goebbels had said um, the, the, the separation between uh, Marxism and, and the Hitler faith is very slight. And I was like, well, well, how could that be? And of course, at the time, he was, you know, the SA was an, you know, a working class movement, and they were trying to appeal to the, the German communists to bring, to bring them over at the time. 
But and people I, forget we're, that we're, when we're talking. I mean, just to butt in for a moment, oh, yeah. we're talking about national socialism, mm -hmm. which is which is. Um, and and you made of made of did you come across that term and you you thought oh this is socialism it's a type of socialism was that was that part of the I don't want to put thoughts in your head but I'm just no no it was and and then also I mean I I'll have to say there was part of me that um you know kind of felt a little burned and whatnot and uh, so so being a leftist is one thing but what is the absolutely edgiest position you can possibly take in all of American politics and it's Hitler did nothing wrong. Like you take that position, you are to the edgiest of the edge of like flamboyant styles, right? And and I'd grown up, like I think we all watched like all those History Channel documentaries, um, you know, about the the neo Nazi movement and the Klan and stuff like that. Um, I still remember the HBO documentary from the early '90s, um, Skinheads, uh, Soldiers of the Race War, which were like, on one hand, these guys were like kind of goofy, um, but for beings like so goofy and not having a lot of resources, obviously. They, they were pushing people's buttons. So like, I think part of it was like, this is a kind of a dangerous, edgy thing to get into. Uh, but then also, as, as you mentioned, ideologically, like I'm looking and at the time I, I'm reading socialist literature. And if I'm being told that like, I can't be on my own community side or even like be, be an activist, if I don't fit into these identity groups, the only logical thing for me then to do is to be a socialist who's fighting for my own identity group of which National Socialism filled that void right. rather well. It just seemed like a perfectly sensible thing in terms of the whole idea of socialism for 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 somebody that's being rejected by the people that call themselves socialists. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and so were, did, are you, were you or are you aware that the Sex Pistols used to wear swastikas on their armbands to uh, upset uh, everybody? Yeah, because yeah, it's, it's, it's an edgy position, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a very edgy position, even though they were never really ideologically connected to uh, fascist thinking. They, they did that just to piss people off, as far as, I, as far as I could tell. It was never reflected in their music, as, as, you know, I mean, in terms of... Uh, but yeah, <laughs> that must have upset a lot of people. Well, and, and just to, to jump briefly forward in the timeline, like mm. something that I'd found out, I'd read um, the book Hate, um, which was about uh, George Lincoln Rockwell and the American Nazi Party. And it, it's not ideological, it's a, it's a history book, and it's fascinating. Um, mm. and, it, and it taught me a lot, because like, like Rockwell, I think, is a very complex character. Um, you know, he served in World War II, he gets back, and he wants to advocate for his positions. Um, and no one pays attention to him for a very long time. But as soon, like the Sex Pistols, as soon as they he put a swastika on, and when they, they named the American Nazi Party, it wasn't the American National Socialist Party, but like what was the punchiest way to get through the, the media, you know, blackout that like I found out as an activist that I could go to like when we would hold rallies in like Kentucky or Tennessee or West Virginia. Um, if we're talking about the opioid epidemic, unemployment, globalization, capitalism in general, no one cares. But as soon as you slap a National Socialist label on it, the entire world media is there. And it's not just for like ego stroking or stuff like that. It then gives you the opportunity to, to talk about the ideas and get that message out there. And that's, that's what Rockwell did in the 1960s. Um, and that was an incredibly successful model for, for me as an activist. Mm-hmm. And then talk about what what was the experience like once you really became fairly known as a far right activist? Well, um, uh, my family um, stopped talking to me pretty much entirely. Um, I mean, I haven't seen my father in uh, over like a decade at this point um, or close to a decade. Um, and your father, you describe politically as as socially politically would you say basically conservative republican christian yeah still today yeah so so if you, i mean if he were so if you had become a, a radical left winger that wouldn't be much of an improvement over a radical right winger for him from his perspective necessarily probably but i mean something you know as i kind of look back over the years um my dad really strived for a long time to be respectable uh, and I think that's one thing that also drove me a lot that like middle Clay, like, he went back to school and got his master's then his master's plus 30. And he, he worked to climb the ladder of being a teacher, to be an athletic director, to doing all these sorts of things, to, to be respectable. 
because uh, his father passed away when he was very young. Uh, his mother was a nurse, worked, um, you know, it was, it was basically just always working, right, to take care of him and his sisters. And I don't think he ever wanted to return to that kind of like crushing working class poverty um, that, that he came from. So he was, he was striving to be respectable in society. And th that really always just like turned me off um, because it just seems so empty. It's like, well, you're not here to see my soccer game because you're, you're taking another class that you don't need to take um, or, or whatever. Not to make it all about my dad, right? We can all get mm -hmm. in with us. But um, yeah, uh, I think if I had become like just a, a radical far leftist and was, you know, getting arrested at like the G8 summit or something, um, that would have gotten him in trouble and, you know, in, in his work. So he, would have turned it down probably because respectability is really the the ultimate currency i think in american culture for a certain class of people and respectability i mean you know not to put necessarily not to make too many assumptions here but re respectability for somebody who's uh, for had a a working class background and maybe financial difficulties historically, and also perhaps uh, someone with a German last name uh, at in your, maybe not your dad's, but your grandparents' generation. I mean, I'm just wondering, like, I think there's a, there's a lot of aspects to respectability and why people need to be respectable. And uh, the, uh, the, the, they don't want to be, they don't want to stick out uh, for a lot of different reasons. There's so many different reasons why people don't want to stick out and it's a lot of self-protection, right? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, because especially with no fallback, really, with with no sense of community. I mean, even if you're a member of a church, it's not the way it, it was or part of a civic group or things like that. So you're you're really on your own. I mean, American culture right now, you're everyone is essentially an island unless you're part of like a religious cult or certain subcultures and things like that. But your your average person is is really alone. So you're just constantly forced to strive and climb in a way that I think is really unhealthy and dangerous um, <laughs> and, and very empty because you're always forced to keep climbing to keep up with the Joneses and you're, you're never going to, to get to that top tier. It's just, it's like an escalator. And then when you uh, also at some point realize that when you're climbing and you're, you're competing with the Joneses, uh, ultimately who you're really competing with is the low, the lowest paid, most marginalized members of our society, right? If you're, mm -hmm. especially if you're doing any kind of work that uh, puts you in competition with undocumented people or with uh, marginalized people, then as somebody, a labor uh, organizer I interviewed recently said, uh, if you're moving to a new state and you're wondering how much you're going to be paid in your industry, uh, look up how much the average black worker makes uh, on that job, and that's how much you'll be making. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree, and and that's the thing. We're traditionally uh, in American culture, like going back 400 years, you know, the the way that systems of capitalism are able to be maintained is that there's a, a very tall ladder, and there's only two rungs for working class people. And in some cases, uh, the white working class is given one rung up and they're told, I mean, Fred Hampton and the Black Panthers, I think, explain this the, the best, that, you know, the, the white working class and the white middle class, which most of them are still members of the proletariat, are, are terrified of any sort of, of revolutionary change or organizing or sticking their nose up or, or upsetting the apple cart because they don't want to be knocked down one rung. And everyone knows they're not going to get any rungs higher. And that allows these systems of oppression for everyone. It affects everyone um, because they're they're up there <laughs> and we're down here, but people don't want to get knocked down that one rung. Um, so they're willing to accept the status quo of the, the economy and American politics. Absolutely. When did you start to figure that out and and uh i mean i well, i i want to before skipping ahead uh there I, let's talk let's stay a little more in in the white nationalist space here and uh where you were occupied for many years it's it's yeah, many years now it, it was and it was until what five years ago or? oh no i mean i i got out officially a year ago only um, one year ago when you wrote me that email yeah. so it was right it was really right then wow yeah. And and by the time you wrote me that email, you had clearly done a hell of a lot of processing already because that was an extremely articulate, uh, very left wing email. I'd say <laughs> if we're going to use these kind of ba you know these I, I hate the phrases left wing and right wing. Actually, I just use them for convenience. They're terrible. Nobody has a def good definition of what they mean, and and it's really better if we use other terms. But we're kind of stuck with these to some extent. I mean, shorthand, and, but that's the way words are basically. Uh, you know, to some extent, they're problematic things. But um, <laughs> 
But so then, when you're 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 in this um, in this movement, your your parent you've you've lost touch with both your parents at that point, and yep. basically you've been alienated by family friends at, at this point, and then and then you you, you were finding a new community. Yeah, in, well, uh, that, and that's a really good way to, to explain it. Um, so I'd gotten involved in an organization called Youth for Western Civilization. Um, which really was the uh, the nucleus of what became known as the alt right. Um, pretty much all of the organizers that that were a part of it ended up, you know, they're either currently working for uh, V Dare, uh, American Renaissance, um, or or spread out. Um, uh, the Wolves of Vinland is a pagan white nationalist cult. Um, well, I would say religious group um, that has a compound or several compounds around the United States. Um, so from Youth Western Civilization, it was. You know, that's kind of where I really got my first introduction into into ideological fascism. Um, and I was being educated, but of course, on the surface, we were to be conservatives. Uh, we were to be edgy conservatives, but still conservatives, where, uh, you know, the first time I threw up a Roman salute and said Zig Heil um, was at a Youth for Western Civilization event um, in private, of course. And uh, I was being, you know, I, I don't want to say indoctrinated because at that time, yeah, I'm 17, 18 years old. But um, I'm being exposed to these ideas and I have a community. And when I got involved in YWC, there was a huge pushback from uh, local anti-fascists and student organizers against our chapter. Um, actually, my, my vice president of YWC at Towson University had a mental breakdown and left school um, because of the harassment. And, you know, mm -hmm. you, you either break or, or you double down. And, um, and Towson, just for context here, I know some folks from Towson, uh, and Towson is, at least in the 90s, I would say it was one of the centers of anarchism among, at least as far as suburban uh, suburban towns go. Not, not, of course, nothing compared to, you know, Washington, D.C. or New York or, or San Francisco, but in terms of, in terms of suburban towns, there, there was a, a, at least, a, there was, at least in the 90s, a, a vibrant uh, anarchist youth scene. And I don't yeah. know if that was the case when you were there, but yeah. There, there, there's a, a, a strong, um, strong activist community there. Um, and they started pushing back against us even harder, which, which I mean, to be honest, not to, not to blame them, but I think like, and if we evaluate my life going forward, you know, one of the things is when people are telling me like, yeah, we've got to fight back against all of these people and they're, they're scum, they're fucking scum. We've got to deal with them because they're going to kill us. And then like, you know, we're, we had like an affirmative action bake sale, um, which obviously I wouldn't do now, but anyway, um, where, you know, white students had to pay $2 for a cookie, black students had to pay 75 cents and to try and bring up attention about um, affirmative action. And like some of the student activists came and like flipped our table over. Um, and that was the first time I ever had someone spit on me. And I'm going to say that like if, if there had been some sort of intervention with student activists at the time that was like, hey, I understand you've got a lot of grievances, maybe we can talk. I think that would have been a lot more successful instead of spitting on me. Um, because I kind of reinforced the narrative I was getting um, from the far right about like, yeah, these these people aren't just your fellow students. They're the enemy. Um, so we lost our student affiliation because uh, our advisor got uh, was the subject of, of harassment for youth Western civilization. So I, I came back to school as a senior and um, the newspaper, the Tower Light, our student newspaper, had referred to YWC as uh, the unofficial white student union of uh, Towson. And uh, I was sitting around with our, our members and I was like, fuck it, let's just be the white student union. <laughs> so we uh, we created a white student union and we filled out all the paperwork and the university rejected us. And that's the first time Vice News parachuted into my life, into my you know crappy uh, you know apartment. <laughs> mm. And uh, it instantly, like it went from, I was just like an activist to like CNN shows up and I'm speaking to millions of people through the media about these ideas. And, you know, I, I basically had a choice then. And my family told me like, you're going to do this or you're going to apologize. And I, I doubled down. Um, Cause at the, I mean, at the time I thought I was right. And yeah. So at, the, at that point, my family cut off all ties, basically all my friends outside of the movement cut off ties. And the movement was my life for the next almost 10 years of my life. Right. That's a, I mean, I think that's a fa such a fascinating um, set of little anecdotes that that uh, you know how this kind of thing goes forward. I mean, it all you know, 
it all from a certain perspective, from your perspective at that time, you can see how it, the whole thing works and, and, and how that you, you, can, you can move in, in that direction as a highly intelligent, very well-read teenage guy. <laughs> and, and that's, uh, you know, that's, which is, I think, especially fascinating because the far right or whatever, white nationalism, white nationalist, white uh, supremacists, whatever, we're, however we're characterizing the whole milieu, uh, people get generally characterized as stupid. And, you know, and actually, what was your experience like generally in that community in terms of how uh, well-read people were or how, uh, what was the variety of backgrounds and, and who were your compatriots in the movement generally, broadly? Well, um, so yeah, there, there's definitely different layers in the movement. And I, I think that's important for people to understand. Um, kind of my generation is the first real internet generation. I mean, I'm, I'm 29. Um, and we all started, you know, having access, you know, I got DSL when I would think I was in, in high school, arguing on forums and exchanging ideas and stuff like that. So like, when people think of the far right, they think of like, Selma, right, in, in the 60s and, and whatnot, or, you know, folks from the backwoods, um, holding on to stereotypes and whatnot. And like, that does exist. But but in my experience in the alt right, um, which I think, you know, we can kind of differentiate as its own subculture. Everyone was incredibly well read um, for the most part. I mean, talking about reading Rene Guénon, um, reading all the works of Julius Evola. You know, if you were saying that, you know, talking and debating. I mean, I know on the left, the difference between a, a trot and uh, and a Stalinist and uh, and a Maoist and you know all the different things. On, on the alt right, there was the the Strasserist faction, um, which I really identified with because that was the the working class socialists who got purged by Hitler. Um, but the socialism is what attracted me. Uh, and then you had the, the esoteric Hitlerists that believed in Hinduism and read, um, you know, people like Savitri Devi um, to talk about, like, studying thousands of years of history about, about the Aryan peoples and philosophy. Um, so that was that section. Now, uh, I will say one of the, uh, the funniest and scariest moments of my life um, was uh, I've had guns pulled on me by Klansmen two different times. Which, if I had a nickel for every time that happened, that wouldn't be a lot of nickels. But it's weird that that's happened twice. Um, Klansman, <laughs> while you were in this uh, the white identity movement, yeah, you, uh, you were. They pointed <laughs> guns at you. Yeah, well, and, and like a um, Norwegian journalist, Vegas Tenold spent about five years embedded with the movement. Um, in his book, um, "Everything You Love Will Burn," um, I'm, I, I guess, one of the main characters. I hate to say that. And even he admits, I was never a white supremacist. So he's a, a Norwegian socialist journalist who now works for the Anti-Defamation League. Um, and he was like, Matt Heimbach is not, was never a white supremacist, but I was in these circles. And white supremacists definitely do exist. Um, but yeah, like there was one time we, we went to a funeral in the backwoods um, and a drunken Klansman didn't know us. And uh, Vegas didn't know the handshake that you were supposed to know. And he uh, pulled a fully loaded gun at us and put it to our faces one of these times and you know if you if you die you die what do you do at that point um mm. so that was that was kind of scary and, and ha another similar situation actually happened um because even when i was in the movement i thought that you know as a christian that uh, black folks can go to heaven which um people took umbrage with um who you know were in the christian identity community that believe that anyone who isn't 100 percent white um is a quote-unquote beast of the field and therefore has no soul and can't go to heaven and they were like you know do you think black people can go to heaven i said yes and they said do you think uh if you have a mixed race relationship does that mean that you can go to heaven and i said yes and i ended up having a gun pulled on me <laughs> that's quite an argument <laughs> quite a qu quite a made a way to make the point <laughs> it, it is i mean and you you hear all sorts of like bizarre things like the first time i'd ever heard of christian identity i mean i grew up catholic um and I was at a League of the South rally in Alabama um, in 2013. So I was still in college and was really new to this. And um, I was being told that uh, that Jews are the um, the spawn of Eve and the snake. Um, so they're they're demons of sorts. And I was like, well, that's not in the Bible. And they're like, yes, it is. And they pointed to verses. And I was like, but that's not what that means. Like, there's 2,000 years of Christian tradition that explains why that's really stupid. Um, and then they wanted to fight over it. But like, I, I was introduced to some very crazy ideas. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's, I, I think there's an oversimplification, long story short, uh, where everyone thinks the far right is dumb. And there's incredibly intelligent people. I mean, I, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but um, I think I was the most well-traveled um, 
white nationalist in American history. Uh, I was in the Greek parliament with Golden Dawn and um, you know, marched with them in the streets multiple times. I spoke at the conference of the National Democratic Party of Germany uh, in Weinheim. Um, I met with uh, members of Noah Dropta in Romania um, and you know, traveled to like half a dozen other European countries to forge these connections. Um, and there's incredibly intelligent people with very strong philosophy and very strong beliefs. Um, there's a lot of folks that just, you know, don't have a whole lot of strong beliefs and, and maybe just fall into uh, kind of reactionary race hatred and stuff like that. I don't want to dismiss that that exists. Um, but my experience in the movement, other than a couple of very odd times, like at that funeral where I had the gun pointed at me, uh, I gave a, a presentation about why the Affordable Care Act was good to a group of uh, robed Klansmen at the time. Uh, they were eating barbecue because I was an insurance salesman at the time uh, doing health insurance. And they were complaining about Obama and saying some not so nice things. And they were like, my insurance has gone up. And I was like, look, Jim. I know your insurance has not gone up if you filled out the application forms properly. Did you click the box on the government website that said, uh, I would like to see if I can, am eligible for assistance in paying my premiums? And he said, well, I don't know. I said, all right, go back. And I ended up uh, walking some Klansmen through the Affordable Care Act process, which is very strange. So like, it, there, there, there's a lot of bizarre moments in, in the movement. Um, and there's some very smart people, some very dumb people, um, some of the like sweet folks that are just like, good family men and family women that are, are kind and would be kind, not just to white folks, but everyone. And there's some, some hateful bigots. It's, there's definitely a spectrum. And what did you, speaking of, I mean, Europe is also a place where I've spent about half of my adult life. And um, what uh, did you find uh, was the similarities or differences in the European uh, far right movements and, and how much were those movements um, largely reacting to uh, the open borders of the European Union and immigration? Well, um, I, I think a or, lot. Or the disruption, the disruption to society caused by immigration, or at least in their in their viewpoint, which I imagine is, is the, is, that's what I mean. Right. Um, well, like, so for me, like Europe inspired me. Um, I don't think we really inspired Europe because when you think of American white nationalism, it's just like, it, it's reactionary by nature. Like, opposing integration, opposing busing, opposing, um, you know, different, different policies and whatnot, affirmative action, whatever. Um, but be, you know, when I went to Europe for the first time, uh, right after I got out of college, that's what we modeled the traditionalist worker party after not trying to do something that Americans were doing, but organizing it as a European style party. Um, and Definitely, was Golden like, Dawn a particular inspiration, or was there a particular party in Europe that you were inspired by, or just the general level of organization they had um, overall? Yeah, well, definitely um, uh, the NPD in Germany, um, and and then Golden Dawn. Um, you know, all the all the guys that uh, the first time I went actually uh, to Greece, or it might have been the second time, uh, all the leadership was in prison um, because they'd arrested them and held them for eighteen months while the five year mega trial was going on. And um, I got to meet a lot of the organizers and stuff. And I was taking back leaflets um, and magazines and stuff like that to then have a, a buddy that spoke Greek translate them for me uh, in the United States and looking at the propaganda styles and everything because it was, it was something new. Like when I started the White Student Union and wanted to look up propaganda, I had to take an old National Alliance leaflet from the 90s and change the words on it because there was no innovation in style and graphics. The only music was like really bad skinhead music. Uh, you know, oi, 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 you know, putting on the boots stuff. Um, there, there was no cultural innovation over the last 30 years. So to go to Europe, uh, I, I mean, I guess I'm kind of guilty of it. I, I think I, I, along with others, really imported those, those styles into what we see in the modern far right in America, which is a total break from the, the historical movement. And I always have been struck by the level of organization among the European far right. It really, I mean, you know, with uh, there was Charlottesville and of course there was last Wednesday. And of course now we have a president who's a far right uh, organizer essentially. But um, the before Charlottesville, I mean, there had been so few in recent history, so few large gatherings of the right and f thousands of right wingers um, gathering in Berlin or in Athens or in any number of other places, of course, all over Eastern Europe. That kind of thing is, is very normal and, uh, and and engaging in in real serious acts of violence, including against police. <laughs> and I mean, it's really. But uh, were you aware when you went to Greece and Germany that the NDP and Golden Dawn had been 
involved with killing and uh, beating uh, refugees on the streets and, and that sort of thing? This was, were you aware of that and what did you think of that? How did you process that while you were... Because uh, I don't know if that was something that you... Did you did you support that kind of activity? Well, um, so... For I, ideologically? I, well, like, for instance, the first time I went to the Golden Dawn office in, uh, in Athens, which had a, a really thick metal door with bolts on it, and then you get to the second door... Uh, and they had, you know, half a dozen security guys there with cameras and stuff. And then eventually, you know, you get patted down and you get to go up to the office where the, the adorable, like, 35-year-old, uh, you know, female secretary is typing uh, out things for the parliamentarians and whatnot. Um, but they had a, a huge wall where they had um, painted uh, the, the pictures of the, the two Golden Dawn comrades who had been assassinated by a Marxist organization, um, I think, in, like, 2011 or 2012, um, and other pictures of Greek patriots that were that were on the wall um, who had been killed during um, the, the Civil War and things like that. And um, I mean, I guess for me, like I, I was aware that you know, Golden Dawn, they got into a lot of street fights, especially with Antifa, but also, you know, with folks, you know, immigrant workers and stuff like that. Um, but I guess for me, how I understood it is just politics in Europe is dirty. Like, yeah, on one side, people could be saying, um, like the anti-fascist rapper who was who was uh, stabbed by a Golden Dawn member, that happens. But also, I'm looking at you know 15 pictures of people here that were were shot or stabbed or stuff like that. Um, so I, I guess I just kind of accepted it as that's how how real politic works. Um, you know, both sides engaging in, in violence and intimidation. Um, you know, Golden Dawn offices were firebombed and stormed by anarchists with uh with rams to get through the doors and you know trashing it and stuff like that so i i guess i just kind of assume like if one side does it and the other side does it then it's just it just kind of is you know yeah that makes a lot of sense because i mean i know a lot of anarchists and uh socialists in north america and in europe who very much um adhere to the um, what Trotsky said that the only good fashion, you know, that any, any, you know, that, that the, that every, that it is, what is it? It is the duty of every communist to acquaint a fascist head with the sidewalk. Yeah. And, um, and that's, uh, that's a, a, a perspective that a lot of people, uh, take very seriously. And as far as they're concerned, um, they're fighting evil. And, uh, but it seems like, um, when you got uh, if the evil people keep on multiplying and there's uh, forty thousand of them coming to the White House last Wednesday, uh, maybe uh, different tactics other than just um, you know sort of total confrontation and non communication um, could be better than um, than this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in, in, in terms of that, David, like, like for me, um, what changed my position um, on, for instance, like the um, the the JQ, the the Jewish question. Um, mm -hmm. oh, well, is that, you, you call that the JQ? Huh? That, is that well, what they call it, the JQ? A, yeah, that's the movement shorthand. Um, you know, how, are you woke on the JQ? And if people don't know what you're talking about, then you know they're they're not. Then you you do, yeah, move on to the next person, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But. You know, towards the end of my time in the movement, a um, an uh, anti-fascist organizer who I had actually faced off against um, at multiple protests uh, was talking to me and was like, "Well, what about members of the Jewish working class, like that work in a factory or work on a farm or run a small shop? Like, are they determining the policy of the Federal Reserve? Are they advocating for for Israeli apartheid? Like, do you hate those people?" And I was like, "Well, well, no, right." And then I start to think of like, so the problem isn't Jews then, right? Like, cause I'd been told in the movement and read the books and stuff like that. Like it's, it's the Jews, it's the Jews, it's the Jews. But if there's a whole huge section, I mean, I, I know for yourself, like that was also like a very weird moment um, <laughs> for me being like, I loved your music the entire time I was in the movement. And I was like, what do I do with this? A lot of conflicting things. Um, my problem isn't with Jews. My problem is with imperialism and capitalism. Um, and I honestly, like, it sounds stupid. Like at some point I should have thought about this. I think I'm a relatively intelligent person, but it took an anti-fascist having a conversation with me and sitting down and we had coffee. And I was like, I don't know, like I, you know, at, at the time, like I, I had like a, my, my pistol and I'm, I, he was carrying too. like, is this a setup? Like, am I going to show up and get hit in the head with a brick? Uh, we just had a great conversation and it made me think to myself and reflect 
And honestly, what got me out of being a fascist um, was not being attacked. Like I have been maced, I've been pepper sprayed in Charlottesville. I was hit in the head with a bat, uh, which luckily I was wearing a helmet um, hmm. or my brains would have been on the streets of Charlottesville yeah. um, and all sorts of stuff. Like all that did was embolden me into I am right because you were trying to beat me off the street because you were afraid of my ideas. But one conversation over coffee, uh, along with some other interactions, changed my life trajectory and changed or, and pulled me back enough to be able to start an analysis of my beliefs and kind of take stock of it and and shift them. So like I I, I understand where wow. like that's the, that was the first was that the first time an anti-fascist actually made an effort to have a conversation with you instead of swinging a bat at your head. Yeah, uh, so the first time I met Antifa, um, we were protesting, uh, well, other than like the scuffles I had in, in college, uh, we were protesting Tim Wise in, uh, in, in Indiana, actually. And um, a couple guys came up and they, uh, they asked my buddy Thomas, uh, well, not my buddy anymore, but uh, the guy I was with, Thomas, uh, for a light, and he goes in his pocket to get him a, a light, and they sw swing him in the head and they hit him with a lock and a sock. Uh, wow. and, th and Thomas goes down, and then they start pepper spraying, and I'm in the first street fight of my life. Like, I've always been like a fat nerd, okay? Like, growing up, I wasn't a brawler, wasn't a bully. I've always been a fat nerd who loves sci-fi, likes to read books, and lives a relatively quiet life. And here I am in front of a university in Indiana, engaged in, an, in a street brawl with guys who have weapons, um, fighting. And one of them ended up getting arrested because we ended up dogpiling on them and the cops came. The other ones got away. But they were from uh, Chicago, uh, Chicago ARA. And um, that was my first introduction to Antifa. And basically, every interaction then for the next seven years uh, was exclusively violent, um, exclusively violent um, with us being attacked. And uh, yeah, that didn't really help me have any reflection. Um, but when different and several anti-fascist organizers um, who were familiar with the gentleman in question reached out to me, too, including one from my local area, and we just opened a dialogue that had a bigger impact on me than any time I got maced or hit um, or got bleach thrown on me and stuff like that. Cause, cause that's not, in my opinion, like it, it scares off a certain member, a certain number of people in, in the far right. But the rest of us then say to each other, like, if you're going to go out to a protest, you need to be willing to die. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and the escalation that happened over the past couple of years, like we didn't used to bring guns to protests. <clears throat> right. Now everybody's bringing guns to protests on both sides. Yeah. By the time, uh, like in, multiple in, in, sides. Right. Well, like in Pikeville, Kentucky, when we had our rally where we actually outnumbered Antifa, uh, we knew Redneck Re Revolt was coming, um, you know, the, the militia and members of the John Brown Gun Club. So, you know, we're all looking around like, well, I guess we have to bring body armor and AR-15s. And between the two sides, we could have stormed a small Latin American country. Um, it becomes yeah. a point. At what point is it not pro? I mean, I, you know, when I'm going to these so-called protests um, over the past uh few years when they happen and so many people are carrying guns especially in the past seven eight nine months it's not really i mean now i'm skipping way ahead here and i, I told you i wasn't going to do that but they're not uh, they're not really protests i mean that's not really a protest it's something else i'm not sure what to call it but this is when everybody's armed i mean the, the idea of a protest is it's a, it's a symbolic action where you might do something mildly illegal like block a road or try to blockade a building the entrance to a building or something it's basically symbolic it might have economic impact it might have uh you know get a lot of media it might be theatrical it might be good for communication and other things might get you attacked by the police, but it's not really uh, anything that any reasonable person would call violence. I mean, marching in the street or blockading the entrance to a building is is really not it's not that not you know it's not really violent. You know that's you know if you, if somebody has to you know get stuck in a building for a few hours, you know th there's worse things that can happen in your life. But uh, you know th th this is a what what is. I mean, people talk about civil war. I, I don't exactly know what that could possibly look like, but it's starting to become something that you can almost imagine what it might look like. You know, it, and it's like we're talking much more Northern Ireland than Lebanon. I mean, yeah. when we're talking about, but um, I don't want to skip ahead, though. I want to. I want to. <laughs> sorry, you, sorry, I, I led you on the rabbit trail. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but what? So, did you? Did did you? So it wasn't that um, it was really around the Jewish question that got you thinking. It wasn't so much that you met people from Antifa or from the, any group that we might identify as left or anarchist who actually were expressing 
uh, sympathy for the white working class and and the problem, the plight of the white working class. It was much more around like um, what you didn't believe than what you did. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, like for me, for instance, like living in Appalachia, um, you know, even when I lived in Indiana, um, the, the joke from where I was living in southern, southern Indiana, right in the Kentucky border is uh, southern Indiana is the south's middle finger to the north. Um, it's, it's very strongly uh, like a, an Appalachian region culturally um, and, you know, living in Tennessee for a very long time now, um, seeing things like the opioid epidemic which I've been to a lot of funerals um, for folks I know who have lost family members um, and, and even a comrade who, um, who lost his fight with opioids. And when you see the Sackler family, um, who is Jewish, uh, who runs Purdue Pharma and where no one goes to jail, no one goes to prison and stuff like that, or knowing friends, um, my own wife is a, is a veteran um, who, who served. And a lot of guys that have come back dealing with post-traumatic stress and, and war injuries and, you know, guys that didn't come home for, um, you know, the imperialist wars in the Middle East um, and seeing the influence that, that Israel and Israeli imperialism has, um, it, it, it was easy um, in a lot of ways to say, like, it's it's the Jews. Uh, instead of, uh, upon reflection, it's the capitalists, some of which are Jewish, some of which are Gentiles, some of which are tall and short, and some are men and women and whatnot. Um a disproportionate number of the capitalists are Jewish. I just want to say that um, to be very clear and open about this, and this is just a fact. And and this, um, if you also, you could break things down according to religion and race and all kinds of stuff. And of course, you'll find a disproportionate number of capitalists are also white. Uh, but there's uh, there is uh, all kinds of um, t little grains of truth in these. And then, of course, that goes way back, right? I mean, Jews have been used uh, as a scapegoat in Europe for many, many hundreds of years in order to be scapegoated. But in order to be scapegoated, there were there had to be reason, <laughs> reasons to scapegoat, right? So, of course, you give them the job of money lending, don't let them own property, but let them run businesses. And then, you know, you, you end up with a, a sort of certain form of a ghettoization, which... Um, is a, you know it's a very interesting bizarre form of marginalization sort of a this uh, marginalized slash privileged position in in many societies going way back of course that depending on which country we're talking about I don't wanna, I don't want to get too much into the whole thing but uh, it's um, th was this uh, did you grapple with that whole question of like you know to, I mean Israel is an apartheid state uh, Israel is uh, and and it is and and what is it I think forty percent of America and Jews do identify with Israel, including much of my family from whom I am alienated because I do not support Israel because it is a fascist state. Yeah. Which, but, um, which it truly is. Yeah, it truly is a fascist state. It, by any possible reasonable definition of fascism, Israel is a fascist state. And, and I'm talking right now with a former white nationalist who agrees with me that Israel is that's a fascist a stamp. state. And that's, and that's as, as a guy mean, who knows his fascism, let me tell you. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> okay, yeah. So that, I mean, so this, this makes your, I mean, this is just, I'm you know, now I'm skipping around randomly and nowhere on any kind of chronology here, but this basically, uh, the fact that you actually recognize Israel as a fascist state makes your rehabilitation as a former white nationalist basically impossible, right, in a yes. sense? Well, and that's actually a lot of the pushback I've gotten, because, um, you know, going back and reading Marx, uh, when, when Marx wrote um, about the Jews, he was talking about capitalist Jews um, having, you know, having a disproportionate impact and stuff like that, and Marx himself being Jewish, Right. Saying like, hey, guys, like, let's not be involved in capitalism. Um, and, you know, a lot of Jewish working class people were part of early socialist, anarchist and, and Marxist movements. Um, so, like, I don't think it's anti-Semitic to be anti-Zionist. Um, I don't think it's anti-Semitic to call out uh, folks if they are Jewish in positions of capitalist power that are doing things like, I mean, here in Appalachian in the Midwest, like 200 people die a day of opioid overdoses. Like it, it is it is bad. Um, I mean, we're losing a Vietnam's war worth of deaths every single year, primarily in the white working class um, due to Purdue Pharma and uh, all their cronies and the FDA and whatnot that, that covered for them. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's a really big problem that I've experienced talking with former anti-fascists 
where they say like, will you, you know, what, what are your thoughts on Jews? And I was like, well, if they're working class and they're, they're with me, then I will march with them arm in arm. Like I will unionize with my Jewish coworkers. Like let's, let's do this, but I'm not going to carry water for the capitalists and the imperialists and, and the Israeli fascists that are diametrically opposed to not just the survival of like myself and my kids, but the entire world, like putting us on the brink of, of possibly like a third world war um, due, due to their imperialism. And they're like, ah, well, that's that's closet anti-Semitism and that's closet fascism. Uh, I know you yourself have been accused of uh, anti-Semitism and, and whatnot for your positions on Israel. And as an Orthodox Christian as well, I converted when I was in college. Um, like the issue of Israel, for me, the first church I went to uh, was an entirely Arab uh, church uh, with a lot of Palestinian Christians. And uh, to hear them talk and to talk about their experiences and their land being stolen and what's done to their family and family members that were tortured and things like that, um, I, I can't carry water for the Zionists. Like I have to be diametrically opposed to them because uh, it's, it's immoral. And you know, with, dealing with American Christians is very difficult. Um, you know, the Orthodox Church signed the document Kairos Palestine with the other Palestinian and Arab churches, uh, the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, the Lutherans and whatnot, condemning Israeli apartheid. But then I live here in the buckle of the Bible belt and Christian Zionism is very powerful here. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, you know, everyone who doesn't like uh, Zionism must be a Nazi. Um, so that's, that's difficult uh, in terms of, I hate to say like rehabilitation, but in terms of my perspective, I've changed from being what I would call like a gutter anti-Semite for lack of a better term to having a nuanced position on capitalism. But if anything is anti-Zionist, then you are labeled an anti-Semite and you're still a fascist and words are Be words, you know, because this, this idea of rehabilitation, um, is like, uh, is, is very, uh, to me, very alarming because because what they're really talking about when we talk about rehabilitating white nationalists, when they talk about it regularly on NPR and BBC and have all these shows sometimes, which are interesting, often are, make me want to barf, but they, um, they, they are always talking about, you basically have to adopt normative, uh, basically neoliberal, uh, perhaps even neoconservative viewpoints uh, in order to, you know, do you have to basically, if you're not an Israel supporter and you're not, uh, you know, you, you don't, um, you know, basically go along with the uh, the mainstream political line, or at least some version of the mainstream political line, uh, somewhere between the sort of liberal Democrat and conservative Republican, if you're outside of that spectrum, then you're never you're never really able to be real but rehabilitated because uh, they call the left uh, you know people who are anti-zionist on the left are also called anti-semites and racists and whatever else you know it's uh, well, it, it, it's because it's it's an incredible powerful lobby and I, I think a lot of americans are just so politically inept um and it's on purpose like the the media you know it's all the all, all the news puts out essentially the same garbage with a tiny you know, tiny little spin on it but it supports the status quo um, and I've had, you know, kind of an experience too, like, um, you know, in terms of leaving the movement, uh, anti-fascists contacted me and saying, unless you dox every single one of your former comrades, uh, we will continue harassing and chasing you till the end of your days because you're not out of the movement. And for me, I can just speak in the past year, a tremendous number of the people that I, I bled next to and fought next to and organized with and slept on countless, too many, uh, horrible, horrible, horrible motel floors when we were traveling to do events and stuff like that and bonded with, um, I've gotten out of white nationalism and looking in the same perspective of, uh, you know, Marxist Leninism primarily by talking to them, uh, doxing people just ruins their lives. Um, but it, you know, I think just emboldens some uh, and others, it, you don't change their minds. You're not persuading them. You're just bludgeoning them. And I think it's far more effective. Maybe it's just the Christian in me that believes in, uh, proselytizing, but uh, preaching the good word, uh, whether it's politics or religion, is far more effective than just forcing someone to submit for one reason or another. And uh, like, no, I'm not going to dox my former comrades. Like, as a sense because of because you have actually, and and also that you, communication actually works. Yes, you're, you're, you've you've actually found this on multiple occasions, communicating with your former comrades that you they have actually come around to your new internationalist anti-racist orientation. Yes. Yeah. Di dialogue, like it, like it worked with me having that first dialogue. 
dialogue works. Like you cannot attack people anymore and physically bludgeon them and mace them and get them fired from jobs and stuff like that to make them change their minds. But conversations and fraternity, because I think for, for a decent number of people too, like I know for me, it was really scary uh, to leave because that was, that was my family. That was my life. It's not just ideas. It goes into like, you know, people who like, I was in people's weddings. I went to funerals with their families. Like we used to have a, Ironically enough, because uh, we most people that I knew didn't have family that supported them if they were, their reviews were known. So we would get together for Reich's giving um, to <laughs> have our own mm. Thanksgiving together and have Christmases together. And like you form your your entire community around a shared set of ideals and, and you know, identity and uh, to leave and basically say you must burn all of those people. One and two, we're never actually going to trust you because the thing about traitors, no one actually likes a traitor. Right. Like you can use a traitor, you can abuse a traitor, but there's a reason Benedict Arnold died in poverty um, when he got back to England. Right. No, no one actually likes a traitor. So I think the current outlook of, of anti-fascists in America is if someone leaves the movement, they will use that person, but they have no interest in ideologically indoctrinating them, uh, bringing them into a community to fill that void of, of family and helping them. It's just about the next battle against the fascists. And I think that's incredibly counterproductive. A lot of guys that I've known don't want to leave just because like they will have nothing at that point, friends, you know, anything. Um, so I think a new model needs to be, be implemented. That's understanding, compassionate, um, and, and based on love and not to sound too tacky, but like the current way obviously isn't working. No, really. I mean, if there were actually a, a social movement that could actually have that kind of, uh, inclusive forward thinking uh a, a perspective that is like we need to we need to bring people into this fold and and build this movement because we need to accomplish something not because we're morally correct and we need to react against those bad people right which seems to be much more i mean you know it's a reactive uh, this whole phenomenon as far as i'm concerned i mean as much as i'm part of it and singing about it and encouraging it and a cheerleader of it uh the whole phenomenon of the movements that we've been having uh in 2020 is as with so many other movements very reactive rather than proactive and i would say that the you know it, it, there's other movements in in history that we could point to that that have more proactive uh aspects to them and and really i think uh, you kind of have to to, to, to find a big one, you kind of have to go back to the first half of the century, of the 20th century to find a lot of those more uh, proactive visionary movements that thought they were going to hopefully accomplish something and to some extent did accomplish things. I mean, you know, to the extent that we have some labor protections today, a lot of that is due to some forward thinking uh, movements of the, back in the day. But these, as a history as a history buff, I mean, there's how much of these historical parallels have you been running across where you had to, where you looked at it one way before and then uh, looked at it a different way now? For example, like, um, I don't know, the, the, the 1930s, the Communist Party in the U.S. in the 1930s, or the rise of the IWW in the, in the 19 teens, the Palmer raids, but maybe particularly Bacon's Rebellion, which you, which you mentioned before. And and uh, I don't know if you had a different take on Bacon's Rebellion uh, before you left the movement than after, or did you come across um, Bacon's Rebellion more recently? Well, um, I, I would suggest to anyone who hasn't read it, uh, Nancy Eisenberg's book, White Trash. Um, is, oh my God, it's one of the best books I've ever read. It's it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, even just to get the, the citations and the notes to be able to go back and, and look at how the white proletariat has been treated this entire time and how race and class intersect in America. Um, yes. You know, I think the history of America is one of class, it's not of race, and it's very convenient to say it's one of race, because then we can just change the color of the foot in the boot. Uh, we don't have to remove the boot, right? Um, I, you know, so for me, like looking back at history, I mean, I, I don't want to say I was, I had a schizophrenic sort of perspective, but I know like all the IWW songs, um, you know, like and I, I did in the movement, like from my days when I was a, I, I was a leftist when I was a teenager. Um, and, and I mean, I, I, I guess to a certain extent, like you just, you get so caught up in things. I mean, the, the problem is if a movement uh, existed as the one that you suggested that wanted to unite the working class, then COINTELPRO would be utilized uh, like with the original Rainbow Coalition where you had white folks in the Patriot Party and the Black Panther Party uh, and different ethnic communities working together for socialism and justice. Uh, the FBI will frame you or murder you in your bed um, you know, and kick your doors in. 
so like for me, it, it, I guess it was always odd. Like on one hand, like I, I went like Charlottesville as an example was a rally to protect Confederate statues. And like my ancestors did fight in the Confederate army, but I also always hated uh, the plantation owner. Like you think you're better than me just because you have money people. So it, it was kind of a, like, like a schizophrenic sort of perspective of like, I hate these people, but they're white. And, and what that really boils down to for me, looking at history at the time is it, it's bourgeois nationalism. Like that's been utilized for hundreds of years. Like as um, uh, you mentioned, I've used this line. Uh, I should attribute it more. Um, but uh, one of your videos where you sang um, uh, the Internationale, uh, where you noted that uh, Fra French and Prussian aristocrats suddenly realized they had more in common than they previously thought, and uh, marched on the Paris Commune, um, which had you know, risen up and taken the city for the people. And you know, it's 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 a hard perspective where like where you're told like you know, white solidarity, white folks need to stick together. And then now I kind of look back and go like, you people never had our backs, but it's always convenient. Like you were willing to send my ancestors to get shot and maimed so you could own human beings for your own economic bottom line. And that's the same in World War One. It's the same, you know, currently in the war on terror, like it's being done for Halliburton and, you know, giant arms manufacturers. So I mean, I, I always looked back positively towards the historical, like, class-based movements. The problem was I just didn't see it in any of the modern left. And, and I've heard that refrain a lot from a lot of people when I was in the movement of, like, well, that's how the left used to be. But they're not like that anymore. Now they're just anti-white. And that really kind of pushes you, not to take my own agency away, but, like, that pushes you into, like, well, I got to stick with all the white people. Um, but, you know, for me, there, there was a, a moment not to, not to go down a, an anecdotal rabbit hole. No, this is good. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> but um, uh, everyone knows Richard Spencer, I'm sure. Yeah. He's, he's watching. Um, Richard Spencer is a dick, um, just on a personal level. If, if you know anything about his politics, he's a... Anyway. Um, so in 2007, 2018, early 2018, uh, we were asked to provide security for his event in East, East Lansing. Um, and the cops stood back, uh, and Antifa had taken our, our parking area that was supposed to be designated for us and the cop said if you want to get in you got to go through them and i was like oh, okay um and and a fight broke out and a lot of our guys because the traditionalist worker party was overwhelmingly working class um through and through we were you know we didn't have all the sorts of fancy money like the folks from v dare like peter brimlow he just bought a two million dollar castle with all of his donations um and when i was the leader of our party i never took a salary um all of our money went into activism uh, and we were working class people and uh a lot of our guys got really hurt uh one of them got uh, a fractured eardrum guys got um broken bones it was it was a bad time and uh and i called richard as uh, the police then declared that this was going to be declared a riot and they were going to run us all in if we kept trying to get through um so we had to leave and i called richard and said most of my guys who are severely injured at this point um, and are bleeding all over the place, you know, in our cars as we're, we're going back to our meeting spot. Um, they don't have health insurance. And like, I know you've got money. So we bled at your request to come to this event. Um, and my guys need help. Like we need to take them to urgent care. Like right now, will you help pay for the bills? And he hung up on me. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, I called a guy I knew who, um, was a med student. Uh, and he traveled two hours to come put staples and splints into into our guys. Like one of our guys got split open down the head. Um, and as they were all sitting there eating pizza, uh, and he's -dunk, ka -dunk, ka -dunk, putting putting surgical staples in a guy's head to close it because we couldn't afford to take them to the hospital. Um, and that for me was like a really big moment um, where I realized like Richard, and, and not just Richard as a person. But the entire class of white nationalists, like when you think of the suits of the movement, there's the boots and the suits, mm. they, they will use us, they will sacrifice us. And if one of us had died or been crippled, um, that would have been unfortunate. And it's just like how Donald Trump is alleged uh, after this protest to have said he was disappointed, you know, an aide said this to the media, because uh, it looked very low class. Um, and I Did found you out, say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, saw, I saw it on Twitter. And uh, I found out from a journalist that had been covering the event um, after the fact that, uh, Richard, uh, you know, pointed us, we, uh, our uniform, if it wasn't a t-shirt, was a Dickie's work shirt, which I wear to work every day, uh, and Dickie's work pants and, and work boots, uh, cause we were a workers party. Right. Um, and that's what most guys had. Like we thought like, well, can we get a uniform that you can buy at Walmart for 40 bucks, which is what we can afford. We can't afford a 
$500 suit. And uh, apparently Richard had told this reporter, I wish you could meet a higher class of people than this, as we like were there at his, you know, at his behest to, to protect him. Cause uh, everyone's seen the, the video of him getting punched in the face. He can't protect himself. Right. Um, but that for me was also like a life changing moment where like the people I care about and who I said, okay, we we're going to do this for the sake of white solidarity and are, are bleeding all over the place and like, can't go to work at their blue collar jobs with, with, you know, their hand broken. He didn't care. And none of those people care. And it's not just the white nationalist movement that's dealing with like in, in, in these, um, you know, in the West and things like that, that's all of our elites. They will use this when it's convenient to charge into the Somme or charge into Verdun or go to fight the Prussians. You know, we have to go bayonet the Huns and the Argonne and that's convenient. And they'll use national appeals that, oh, we're, we're, we're kinsmen is the fatherland or the motherland, whatever. They don't care if we live or die. And that for me was really my breaking point where I said like, pardon my language, but fuck these people. <laughs> and then you like, also, you had that breaking point in terms of personal anecdotal type of, uh, you know, personal experience, but also you, you had already, uh, or did you soon develop uh, this sort of anti-nationalist sort of analysis that, uh, uh, that says that nationalism is one of the key ways that the ruling class, along with race, uh, that the ruling class is able to uh, use the working class for their benefit. I think it was J.P. Morgan who said, uh, why should I care about the union movement? I can employ half the working class to kill the other half. Yeah, well, and and that got me to realize because I thought for a long time if I was going to have pride in in my culture uh, and my identity and stuff like that, then I had to be a nationalist, and that means you know all all white folks as we're all in this together and all that stuff. Um, but that's when I really started reading materials um, like coming out of uh, the Rainbow Coalition, going and trying to find old mimeographed like copies of their newspaper and stuff. But understand the difference of patriotic socialism versus nationalism which is totally separate, but the, I think what's a natural, healthy human instinct to have ties of, of kinship. Like that's, that's normal, natural, and healthy. Uh, and I read James Connolly. James Connolly was like truly the, let's, let, let's put the final stone in. Um, because you know, I think James Connolly really explained as an Irish Republican and as a Marxist, how you can, one, fight for the oppressed, not only in your own country, but around the world but also how you can have a positive, affirmative self-identity and community identity, but that doesn't mean to the exclusion of others, to the detriment of others, and how internationalism really works. So like, I, at that point, I kind of started diving back into Marxism, and I read Connolly for the first time, and I was like, aha, this is what I've been the whole time. Like, I, I never really, I mean, I, I guess I was a leader, so I guess I fit into a certain extent, but like I was being called a communist um, for my pro-worker positions and a worker name and stuff like that in white nationalism for years. And uh, you know, eventually, like if the red star fits, you might as well own it. So that kind of, <laughs> that's how I get here, you know? <laughs> and Matthew, you, while you're in this, it, while you're leading the Trad Traditionalist Workers Party, getting all this attention, of, uh, inter uh, I don't know how often, but certainly now and then from from major networks, and and then it's, it's, there's key events that happened in during this time, and I wonder what what went through your head. How did you process things like Utoya? Utoya, Pardon yeah, me. Anders Breivik. Oh, yeah. Um, well, that and and the attacks that have happened, um, like it here in the United States, of so the shooting in Pittsburgh. Um, I mean, for me, like, I guess that was, you were still in the, in the movement, I was still in the movement. and El Paso as well. Um, I, th the Walmart yeah. massacre. Um, yeah. I was close to being out of my timeline fits. Well, and there was always this argument, um, between what I would call the, uh, uh, the politicals and the accelerationists. And this is, I think is an important distinction for folks. Like we had an, it was an FEC registered political party. Like our belief was we were going to use elections to gain political power, to advocate for our positions. But there was this entire group, um, organizations like Adam Waffen Division, uh, The Base and others, and then just the individuals um, who believe in this concept of accelerationism, that they're not going to listen to you. Um, they're not going to let you participate in the process. And we, we must use, um, you know, especially James Mason's book, Siege, um, as a model and Charles Manson, obviously, uh, when I got in the movement, I never thought I'd have to be arguing against Mansonite politics. Um, but you know, you make strange bedfellows along the way, I suppose. Um, 
So there are these two factions between wanting to engage the political system and hold rallies and stuff like that. Um, and these people that just wanted to do terror, because the way you bring down the system is, is you crash it. Um, you force the system to overreact, you bring out civil strife, and then we're just going to slug it out, right? And whites are going to come out on top. And I argued against those people for a very long time, saying that it was immoral. Like, as a Christian, I, I can't support killing civilians. Like, and I was always opposed to those positions. Um, but I have to say, after Charlottesville, when the deplatforming happened, um, where everyone lost their websites, their credit card processing, and stuff like that, and... I mean, I'm, I was there, obviously, and uh, still being sued over it four years later, uh, which is fine. I don't have any money anyway, um, and I think I'm innocent, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, the accelerationists won the argument, fundamentally, because if you can't hold a permitted protest um, without you know, having the cops stand down, I mean, cop, p- pigs are pigs, but um, you can't engage the political system, you can't have a Twitter, you can't get your message out there, the only option left is violence. Uh, and Anders Breivik kind of started that, uh, and it's only accelerated since then, because, and I'm not saying that all these social media companies should allow every Tom, Dick, and Harry with an organization to be platformed, but I mean, the problem is, for those of us who are in the movement, saying like, no, we're going to engage the system, we're going to do this legally, we're going to do this peacefully, like, we're going to run someone for city council, like, that's what we're going to do, and other people being like, well, they're not going to let you do that, they didn't let you do that, now you're banned off the entire, uh, you know, above above web, you're on the dark web using a Tor browser just to read a blog post, um, we have to do some terrorism. And they've fundamentally won the argument in a lot of ways, where like, deplatforming, I think, has led to an increase in these lone wolf attacks, where again, like, this goes back, I think, to the 1970s in Britain with the deplatforming movement and, and the no platform, where we're not going to talk to fascists, we're not going to argue against fascists, we're going to crush fascists. And, you know, 95% of people or 99% of people aren't going to do anything. But if you can't have your voice be heard, and, and we see this, I think, in the Islamic community in Europe, um, you know, when mosques are shut down and there's harassment of Muslims uh, and things like that, that's a breeding ground for the most radical position to say, look, you, you can't run a political candidate. Like they're, they're coming after you. You have to fight. You have to kill. You have to you win the struggle. And um, it leads to radicalization. Um, so I, I think it's kind of off topic from, from how this started, but I was always against very, violence. Yeah. Very on topic anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was always against violence, but we, we've reached this position where I, I think that the, the most radical of the radical um, that, that aren't even white nationalists. Cause the idea of when we were white nationalists was we want to build a white nation. We want to have a country. We want to be at the United nations. We want to like figure out trade policy and stuff versus people that want to actually just do terror. Like the purpose is terror. The purpose isn't to build the purpose is to destroy because they have like a Mad Max Charles Manson fantasy and it's dangerous. And now it's, you know, there were plenty of times when I was a movement organizer where people would say, we have to do something. And it's like, well, handing out leaflets and organizing and recruiting is doing something. And that was enough. And like, I think back to Dylan Roof, I actually, um, after Dylan Roof did his shooting, I was the only white nationalist uh, who went down to South Carolina to participate in the peace vigils um, and lay flowers at the church and uh, condemn the actions in person, which I, I, that, that, that was a very tough, situation um and Mm. there were a lot of people who recognized me and were not very happy um (laughs) with me but i thought it had to be known that we didn't stand behind these actions and didn't speak Mm. for us but when i read dylan roof's manifesto where he he says in it that no one's doing anything he was like well the kkk is here but they're they're irrelevant i feel like i need to do something and what really bothered me at the time and it still bothers me that like if i'd been able to meet him and get him engaged in a way that that made him feel that he was getting his voice out there by by his own words he wouldn't have done the horrific act that he did um people need to feel engaged they need to feel listened to and, and find a way to solve problems together um win or lose but this alienation isolation i mean whether you want to talk about ssri drugs that are prescribed that that lead to all sorts of stuff that's a whole nother issue but like I, th- there's a lot of isolated alienated individuals now that what's ssri oh um the the psychiatric drugs mm, that mm-hmm. you know you, you take them for depression and they you know yeah. side effects is uh increased suicidal ideations like that's mm. not <laughs> mm. ideal yeah. big pharma uh not friends of ours but um, um friend of mine jumped off a bridge just just after getting on those drugs 
that's there's a lot like it but but yeah so like kind of answer your question like i i was against it and like i think we've got a serious problem in american society right now and the neoliberal neoconservative solution of just silence these people and push them off the public sphere is is leading directly to a a tiny subset of the people that might have like pro-white views into the most extreme ideology that's in an echo chamber we've got guys like the organizer of the base that didn't even live in the United States that was telling young men to go throw their lives away and to hurt and kill other people as a chicken hawk organizer. Like, and that's from Russia. Yeah. From Russia to, to serve your people. This is what you have to do. Not taking his own risks. And I think the problem is only going to get worse. And the answer, I think again, not to sound tacky, but is more dialogue, compassion, understanding and bringing people out of the darkness to like humanize them. Because a lot of people don't feel like they, they feel like the entire system hates them, and it does. Um, but it's because they're they're working class. It's and, and it alienates them because they're working class. But if they're only being fed one mantra and they're in echo chambers, bad stuff happens. And like I, I think the current way to crack down on domestic terrorism is being done entirely wrong. And I, I think it's either gross incompetence or on purpose. Um, Looking at how Muslim Americans have been treated over the past 20 years, the war on terror, the system loves uh, to create fake charges to get impressionable young people um, to say, yeah, I want to blow something up. And then they get to justify their budgets for another year for the surveillance state. uh, And they throw a young Muslim man away in prison for the rest of his life. And I think they're just moving to a different target. At this and point. they do the same to, to for white nationalist groups, and as actually that that yeah. they do in, with uh, Muslim groups. I mean, it, they do that with anyone. That's their setup. I mean, that's their their mo is is setting people up like that. This, uh, which is actually um, not. I mean, it's questionable in terms of how legal it is uh, for for them to be doing their things like. I mean, you heard you know about that group of guys from Newburgh, New York, who was supposedly going to blow up the Sears Tower, but they couldn't even find Chicago on a map. <laughs> None of them had a driver's license. Yeah. yeah. Well, and they've done the same to, um, you know, to anarchists and stuff like that. I mean, this this is COINTELPRO in the 21st century with an advanced uh, you know, surveillance state because they there has to be terror. There has to be violence. And I, I don't think the, the ruling class cares if, um, you know, a bunch of Mexican-Americans and, and immigrants lose their life in a Walmart or a bunch of elderly people are killed in a synagogue um, or if a bunch of, you know, white Americans in Kansas are killed by, by a jihadist because that doesn't affect them, but it does justify the systems of oppression that the state is utilizing that Chelsea Manning um, and, and Edward Snowden have revealed um, that they're using on all of us. So I, I think the violence it's not so much planned, but they, they create the situation with fake arrests to justify their budgets, but the violence is actually beneficial to the ruling class to, to justify their, uh, their their current state of running things. And talking for a moment about um, the um, deplatforming on, on the social media and all that, taking away your ability to process payments and all that kind of thing, this... Um, like this is obviously massive national convers global conversation right now after Wednesday, uh, and the um, and and there's the the whatever passes as the left is very divided on the whole question uh, of censorship either either pro censorship or anti censorship or they have some kind of more nuanced perspective. But it seems to me that uh, the whole conversation is kind of off to the side somewhere because nobody's really talking about algorithms and i'm not sure how well people even understand how the algorithms on uh, that you know youtube and facebook in particular but also i guess twitter to some extent but i think that the you know to, it's a little more nuanced with twitter but i mean in terms of facebook and uh, and youtube their algorithms are driving people to find more and more extreme thoughts and whatever uh, ideas uh, in whatever realm they're already interested in uh, just to keep them glued to the screen and it it just uh, no matter how much deplatforming goes on as long as those algorithms uh, continue then they're just going to drive people uh, into those rabbit holes more and more and and it, it, the it's the algorithm that has to be changed at least uh, I'd, I'd say far more importantly than any kind of like deplatforming and in fact I'm not sure how much deplatforming would even be necessary if they didn't have these algorithms because they prevent people from really communicating with each other in the first place. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, no, I mean, this is an example of capitalism where ad revenue rules all, right? So, I mean, in terms of like the fact that one of my coworkers who I've had many conversations with, uh, he's a flat earther. Um, he's a, a gentleman of color, like he's not affiliated with any sort of far right groups, but he is absolutely a QAnon supporter, even though he's not a Trump supporter and he's a flat earther. And where literally, he, literally, you know, he believes the earth is flat. Literally, he believes that the earth is flat. Um, and you know, where do you find this? Needs to you know, watch these videos on YouTube and stuff like that. And and yeah, because it is absolutely in the interest of big tech to their existence, because they're not charging subscription fees, that to be able to pay off their stockholders and whatnot and give themselves a nice new yacht every single year, they need that ad revenue. So they don't, for all that they care uh, in their platitudes about diversity or to about helping marginalized communities and all that stuff like that. At the end of the day, they're capitalist corporations that exist to make profit for their stockholders. And they will allow any sort of content that exists that is still profitable to them, no matter how destructive it is to society at large. Um, so I think that's, I think you're right. That one of the biggest problems like QAnon, okay. Like obviously in my opinion, uh, our elites are a bunch of sketchy people that do morally reprehensible things. Um, I think things like the Iraq war using depleted uranium on civilian populations or agent orange or stuff is horrible. I don't think there's satanic sacrifices underneath pizza restaurants. Uh, right. But you've got like, I think the rally in DC, a lot of those people are just normal conservatives for all the, the like the far right groups that were there. Um, most of those people are like normie, normie conservatives. And they have been fed a, fed a steady diet of fake news since before the election, that the election was stolen, that the American system is illegitimate. Like I live here in Tennessee and I was listening to uh, Kelly Loeffler's ads on the radio over and over and over again that we needed to stop socialism. We needed to save America. We needed to fight so our children would have a future. And it gets people, you know, they're hearing this message over and over and over again. And these algorithms exist to keep people plugged in. So they're watching the next video and they're reading the next article. And, da, 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 da. and, and you wonder why people storm the Capitol. Like, I'm not trying to take agency away from those folks. But like, when they're fed a steady diet from the president of the United States, who we're supposed to like, respect at least the office even if you don't like him right this is the highest office in the land yeah. <laughs> yes to, he to was elected yeah to senators and representatives media pundits to like the random guy in serbia that's running a meme page uh and putting out fake information so he can get ad revenue right all yep. the way down like words do have consequences at a certain point and at these yep. big tech companies i think you know, one for the for the rally on wednesday I was jump too far ahead, but I no. think uh, the, the blood is on Donald Trump's hands and the Republican Party, but it's also on big tech's hands. Very much. And that's until we address these problems, like, you know, it's just like Jeff Bezos saying like, well, I'm going to invest $5 million in marginalized communities. And it's like, you made that in 25 minutes. Like, yep. you know, like it's, <laughs> By exploiting marginalized people. <laughs> right. I, I've worked in an Amazon warehouse. Like my wife yeah. has worked in an Amazon warehouse. It, it sucks. Horrible. It's it's yeah. not good. But like mm -hmm. these these big tech people are responsible for because misinformation is profitable and division is profitable because if people are in flame wars with each other or in their own echo chamber, they're staying on the platforms and they're making the the people in charge money. And so I think our entire system is broken in that way. And I don't think big tech can be fixed. I think like these big platforms should be nationalized to a certain degree to become part of the public square for discussion and debate of ideas so long as they exist for profit they're going to keep being a destructive influence on our democracy yeah on on our democracy do we have a democracy no we have an oligarchy but it's got a really high uh, production budget that makes it seem like it's a democracy <laughs> that's a perfect perfect way to put it <laughs> an oligarchy with a high production budget i have to remember that that is fantastic <laughs> Well, you know, the entire American system is just a couple companies and banks wearing a trench coat, uh, trying to buy an R-rated movie ticket and saying that they're a country. Like, it's it's a capitalist system. It's always been a capitalist system. Like, going back to when we were colonies, they came here and they took my ancestors and yours and lots of other folks, like, and they called us fertilizer, right? They said that our labor and our debts and our sacrifices were fertilizer for them for this new land so that they could make money. Most of the people that made huge amounts of profits off the colonies never stepped step foot here. 
And that dynamic has never changed. That and they expected the colonizers to die, and they died. I mean, they people were didn't live oftentimes more than a few years once they got to these terribly harsh conditions uh, of uh, like, uh, of course, the most famous example being Jamestown. What yep. a terrible disaster that was. <laughs> well, and it just gets into like um, something I didn't know uh, until I read White Trash, but then I did more research is about like the white working class, how we would be, well, not we like I was there, but like the, the people would be pushed after an area had been properly civilized. Um, and oh, it's a town now and we're making a bunch of money and everything's great. And they would push the people into the frontier so they yeah. would get in contact and then get in conflict with indigenous persons, kill them. And if a bunch of white working class people died, well, who cares? Uh, and eventually that area, they would start building little communities and stuff like that. And, oh, it's time to bring civilization another 50 miles um, you know, into America. And th the same process would happen. They kept pushing them farther and farther west through economic exploitation and control of the political power. And like to look back at the history of America, like, America was never great, in, in my personal opinion. And that's you know, someone who, like, half my family's been here since dirt. And, like, I'd like to think I'm I'm patriotic to some degree, but not for the United States. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a history rant. Like, no, I, that's, <laughs> a, that's a good history rant. A very good history rant. So we, you and I have been in touch regularly on and off for the past year, I guess it was. And mm -hmm. then... Um, I was. I had wrote this uh, open letter to the uh, Patriot Prayer and and the um, Proud Boys, and I uh, and which I feel like like I, I feel like I understand how to try to communicate with people because I am a member of, I, I'm because I'm white and I'm a member of the working class, and I think I also just I grew up in this country and I I think I understand the indoctrination on on multiple sides because I'm an intelligent person so <laughs> you know I and I I wrote this thing and it's just one of many things that I've written where I'm actually without being necessarily except in this case explicit about it I'm that's who I'm trying to reach uh despite the fact that it looks like I might be preaching to the choir that's just because the choir is the ones who listen you know it's not because that's who I'm necessarily only trying to reach but um you, a lot of people said it, it that my piece was uh, made a lot of sense, and and uh, and a lot of people said it's the left that need to read this at least as much as anybody else, uh, which I totally agree with. Even though I called it an open letter to the far right, it's really not necessarily only to them. It's about communication, really. But um, and talk about your impressions of that and any other. I don't know. You you. Th you thought it made sense, and and this is, and you think that it's it's uh, possible to communicate on the basis of the, the many things that we have in common with yes. each other around mar marginalization by being members of the working class, and and to explain how we've been divided and ruled by these mechanisms of nationalism and racism. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, of, of course, like the 2016 election was. Uh, a moment where a lot of people started clutching at pearls, as an example, to explain the Trump movement, like, ah, oh, the, the the deep resurgence of white supremacy in America. And like, I mean, all the all the, the different things. Like we, we listen to NPR. Like, I listen to NPR every time I go to work uh, and I come I home. I listen to it way too much. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just wrote an essay actually called How NPR Divides and Rules. But anyway, go on, please. Uh, and NPR, uh, an organization that uh, referred to me as an insurrectionist uh, on an article that they published yesterday, which was great, uh, considering I wasn't in Washington, D.C. Um, but anyway, you know, don't but let Fox. They, they were going on Fox because Fox, I mean, just for the record, Fox just ran an article two days ago saying that you were in D.C. because somebody supposedly saw you there and you weren't. And uh, and they retracted the article. But yes. then uh, it too late for NPR to not catch on to that and also make the assumption that Fox was correct and that you were there. Yes, all because Lynn Wood, um, who of course thinks that Supreme Court justices are like killing and raping children on camera for blackmail, um, which not a balanced individual, I'll just say that, uh, because he put out a, a tweet uh, and it, you know, goes, you play a game of telephone, but you've got uh, taxpayer subsidized media outlets uh, saying that uh, I, Matthew Heimbach, was trying to overthrow the U.S. government on Wednesday. Um, which uh, I didn't, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's a minor point. <laughs> it's, you, it's, you, it's not like they're accusing you of much. <laughs> no. Well, I, I don't think uh, the mainstream news has ever let facts get in the way of a good story. Um, no. Nope. 
So that's that. But anyway, uh, so like we, we, we've all listened over the years uh, to trying to explain the Trump movement and explain MAGA and stuff like that. And like, I'll tell you this, as an organizer in white nationalism, um, one of the times we had a rally in Kentucky, a small town called Pikeville. Uh, Pikeville uh, used to have industry, used to have mines and stuff like that. There's, there's nothing left. There's like a hospital and a college there now, uh, and that's keeping the town and the county afloat. Uh, opioid epidemic is, is, is huge, a lack of health care, lack of education, lack of jobs, just it, it's a beautiful place. The people are beautiful, but it's it's not doing great. And that was solid Trump country. And for me, um, part of the thing is when we held our rally there is you had to bring uh, household supplies, uh, diapers, food, something that can be utilized to give to a family. And we'd put it up. If, if you're in need of help, uh, we will allocate supplies to local families that need it. Um, and I went uh, with, with two of my comrades uh, with a couple bags of, of, of groceries, non-perishables and diapers and stuff like that um, to a family that, that was in a trailer um, in one of the haulers. And, you know, it's never a comfortable situation to see a grown man cry. Um, but, but the father teared up a little bit and thanked us and really appreciated it. And he told me that no one from any political party had ever knocked on his door and had never asked him what he and his family needed. Um, but the Nazis were here, right? Like, yeah. I, and he had no problem with us being in his house and sitting with his family and playing with his kids. And like, it was, it was a moment that impacted me um, a lot. And, and to yeah. think that there's truly millions of people um, I mean, the war on poverty was launched in Appalachia, and I know I talk about Appalachia a lot, but that's where I am. And I did most of our organizing. Almost all of our party chapters were in Appalachia or the Rust Belt. Um, there's millions upon millions of people that are being ground down by capitalism, and it's not a new phenomenon. Like, they were paying people in company script up until the 1970s in some of these places. Like, they've been abandoned and ignored and spit on for a long, long time, sacrificing their men and their boys into the maw of industry and mines to be crushed and crippled and get black lung and then thrown away. Like, and to go to war too. That's also yeah. significant, isn't it? I mean, how many, because one thing I, I read recently, I don't know, it, because it, I mean, it all it all corresponds also so much to where there's poverty and, uh, you know, the, where the Rust Belt is and where there's unemployment, etc. But the fact is, uh, some of Trump's biggest support comes from the counties that have the highest number of combat veterans. Yeah, I mean, Tennessee is known as the volunteer state. Um, and, and I forget, I, I think it was one of the Black Panthers who said it, um, that they'll never have to reinstitute the draft uh, so long as poverty exists. And it's it's true. Like, folks don't want to go, uh, like my, my wife, when, when she volunteered to join the United States military, it was so that she could go to college and she could have health care and a steady job. Because, like, East Tennessee is, is not, nor ever has been, an incredibly vibrant economy. And... You know, the, the thing is with, with folks, to understand them, they weren't voting for Trump because, in, in my opinion, well, some of them were, but, but the overwhelming majority were not voting for Trump because they didn't like Muslims or they have a problem with Latinos, whether they are legal citizens or whether they're undocumented. They just want something different from the grinding poverty and exploitation and, and the misery that is their everyday life. And no one has even pretended to pay lip service to them since, like, Huey Long was killed in Louisiana. Um, there hasn't been a single political movement that's really spoken for people that are that are left behind. And, like, so it's very easy for them to get brought in by Donald Trump, where even most of them know that, like, he, he he's a grifter. He's a dishonest, non-Christian, like, grifter. But at least he was even trying to pretend to give a shit. Uh, and I think that's a big drive amongst like a lot of patriot organizations, the far right to get back to the article and the, the, uh, trying to answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> but like uh, the big thing is if you start out from a premise that these are bad people, that these are morally deficient people that are members of these far right organizations or who support Trump or things like that. Deplorables. Um, yeah. Deplorables. You, you lose the argument instantly and all you do is reinforce that no one on the left gives a shit about us they think that we are backwoods gun-toting hillbillies that they they say they hate and we're the problem in this country and uh you know forget it oh, we'll, we'll go over here then like 
you know, I, I did not get, when, when I was doing my organizing, did not get a lot of uh, uh, space when it came to working in college towns. Mm-hmm. But I tell you what, in small impoverished communities, when we were doing um, right outside of Louisville, Kentucky, uh, we were having a, one of our first party meetings and uh, there was maybe a dozen people and I was handing out our, our newsletter uh, action and stuff like that and, and giving a small little presentation in this pizza shop. And a guy stood up who had been sitting and listening to us, but wasn't with us. And he came up and he said, give me a membership application for him. Hmm. Cause I've never heard someone talk like that. And it's not that I'm that great of a public speaker. It's just that people just want someone to fight for them. And I, I think your article was amazing. Um, not to blow too much smoke, but like it, the fact it humanized people and treated them like they actually mattered like is is the the true heart of how we can start a dialogue in this country because i don't think most proud boys hate people who are different than them or even people who disagree from them but they've just the the establishment has ignored them for so long like you know hurt people hurt people right and i think when it comes politically we're, we're seeing that that folks are hurt like just because they've been suffering in silence now i think looking at blm as an example like marginalized harassed exploited communities have started to fight back and push back in this country because no one has listened to them for a very long time and they have so many legitimate grievances that need mm. to be addressed at a societal level but there's just kind of this mindset in america that if you're like a a white socially conservative person and I'll I'll get flack for this probably from some people in the comments, but like there's, you're used by the Republicans to turn out to vote, but like no one actually seems to care. So the first way to short circuit them being pushed into the far right or still carrying water for this system is just showing them a little bit of compassion and respect. Like no one, we tried everything. We tried to throw bricks at them, tried to get them fired from their jobs, tried to call them names and that hasn't worked. Like, let's talk to him and, and your article. Like I'm, I'm sure you've you know gotten a lot of flack for being willing to just even have a conversation with folks. I actually haven't. And really? actually uh, all the, all it was, has been very um, heart heartwarming to, to see. And I, I, there's a lot of the articles I've been writing in the past uh, uh, couple months, especially where I keep on expecting to be uh, hated upon by uh, doctrinaire left wingers, or you know, certain members of the left that you know that I've written songs about that are that are very um, <laughs> narrow minded. Uh, but uh, I, I've been surprised that it's it's been in, it's been entirely um, positive feedback. Although sometimes uh, the lack of positive feedback from certain quarters makes me wonder if there's some people. People not feeling so positive about it, but nothing negative anyway. So well, that's, that's good. Been interesting. Yeah. Well, and maybe we're we're reaching a point in this country where like I don't, dialogue can happen. Uh, I mean, you know, as you'd mentioned before, like with the uh, about the arms and stuff, and how like between the far right and the far left. I, again, I hate to use those terms too. Uh, it's been like an arms race uh, in a certain way for public demonstrations. Now everyone's going in like yeah. tack gear and body armor and AR-15s. Yeah. Um, which is not helpful, but no. so long as subcultures exist that feed off of one another and the conflict is what draws in supporters and that's the draw is not wider societal change. It's about you know, you're here to fight like anti Antifa and then Antifa being like, we have to fight the fascists and which like anti Antifa I always hated because like, it's just fa, right? Mm-hmm. Like if, if you're anti Antifa, <laughs> like you're just, you're just fa, like you're just a fascist, just own it. But anyway, yeah. Um, yeah like, Anytime, like, I, I think that's what we need is a lot more openness and, and dialogue. Cause at the end of the day, like, if you're a proud boy and you're mad that your job is gone, um, that your factory town is drowning in opioids, uh, that you don't have a future and you're pissed off, like, you should be pissed off. Like, you, you wrote about that in the article, like, you should be mad. Um, but you're not necessarily being mad at the right person because the you know the undocumented immigrant or or the black single mother or the the you know uh, Hispanic father of three that lives two towns over or right down your street is facing the same fundamental problems. And if we all got mad together, there's not very many of those people. <laughs> yeah. 
Although even if we all get mad together, we all still know that we don't make uh, government policies and the government can just keep on trying to divide us by doing things like, say, uh, inviting in lots more immigration, which is like not uh, in not to be saying anything negative about immigration at all, uh, you know, uh, lest anybody misunderstand. But uh, this is uh, it, this can be used as a divisive tactic, and it has been throughout the history of this country. And if you look at the uh, labor movement in the early 20th century, like how the industrial workers of the world had to have 26 different languages represented in the Lowell strike, they had to have 52 representatives, each of whom were two uh, two for each of the 26 languages spoken on the floor of the mill in order to try to communicate with each other, in order to try to organize ultimately a very successful strike. Uh, but um, the, the, the company did not actually need to hire from 26 different immigrant groups. They did that very intentionally. Well, and, Jeff uh, which, Jeff and not that there's anything that wrong with that, with hiring 26 <laughs> different immigrant groups. Let, let me just clarify. But they did that in order to divide people. Well, yeah, and Jeff Bezos is doing it now. The leaked document that came out last year that uh, Whole Foods specifically wants to have diverse workforces um, for the purpose of uh, anti-unionization efforts. Like they, they, they utilize diversity not because they think it's a strength or not because they want to employ people of different backgrounds, but to try and make sure that no one unionizes their stores. And like Henry Ford, the fascist uh, that's willing to go and, uh, and get medals from the Third Reich, um, when union organization was taking off in Detroit, he's the one who, who pushed to ship up uh, out of work you know, black workers to create racial strife on the factory floor to you know attempt to stop labor organizing. Like that, that's the sort of thing that we need to understand. And I think there's a problem uh, on the left, in my personal opinion, where like the issue of immigration, like yeah, we shouldn't be mad at immigrants because how would I feel if the United States came in, overthrew my democratically elected government, had corporations ruling and exploiting me and like Coca-Cola was hiring death squads to like murder my local union organizer and gangs that are running drugs like for the CIA um, are running amok. Like, yeah, I'd want to take care of my family. I'd want to go somewhere safer. I'd want to make a better life. Like we should have compassion. Um, but but I, th I think the push, um, you know, Chomsky, I have a lot of critiques of Chomsky, but, you know, he said um, that capitalism begins as racist uh, because that's a way to exploit people and their resources, but inevitably becomes anti-racist because things like racial identity, religion, culture, language, things like that get in the way of human beings being um, just interchangeable cogs and producers and consumers like they want to sell Budweiser in Saudi Arabia. Like, you know, they, but religion gets in the way. So like there, there's this problem of where if you say like maybe immigration is having an impact on local wages and things like that, and we should have a conversation doesn't mean you're anti-immigrant. Um, but capitalists are using this weapon and this tool um, of using working people from different backgrounds against one another, like literally destabilizing countries to push people um, into other countries for their for their benefit. Um, yeah, so and I, if you look at what happened in Europe, I think it's another one of those perfect examples of how after the de the fall of the Soviet Union and the expansion of the European Union, and then you have this uh, okay, we're one big European Union now, and then uh, you've, once you've bought up and and you bought up all the state resources of the former Eastern European countries and basically destroyed all their economies systematically through through buying up on and supporting all the oligarchs, and then you have massive waves of immigration from Eastern Europe to West. Western Europe, and then you have Brexit and all this other stuff, and it's like, you know, we, we, this is a this is all like a big game. But how many people are are seeing that that it's a big game, and how many people are being accused of being against immigration if they even talk about it? Well, yeah, I mean, for instance, like if if you're in London and you know they talk about like the Polish plumber, like I'm pretty sure your your average Polish immigrant um, probably wants to be at home in Poland, like with his community and his family, but he needs to create a living for himself and uh yeah, of course the united states um god bless him uh you know we love democracy unless the russian parliament isn't doing what we want after the fall of the soviet union so we help yeltsin bomb democratically elected individuals to uh to turn over russia to the oligarchs and things like that literally and if yeah. people don't know that history they really should i mean if you don't know your history you're you're, you're suffering from amnesia and you're just going to repeat all the mistakes that have been made before but people just have to know that history that what you're talking about they bombed the russian parliament and yeltsin declared power and just 
pulled the rug out of this, the whole existence of the Soviet Union by declaring Russia an independent country. And of course, Russia was the biggest of the 15 uh, Soviet uh, states. So it, the Soviet Union wasn't viable as an entity after that. But that's how he took power from Gorbachev. Yeah, it, it was a capitalist coup. And it's something that's been repeated around the world. And like, well, to go back, just speaking of like destabilization, how people need to know their history, um, your song, uh, Korea. Um, is is phenomenal, by the way. But uh, um, I think it's in like the the second or third verse where where you ask, um, you know, why our why our leaders, um, you know, like talk the way they do, and um, you know, we spent we dropped more munitions on North Korea than we dropped pound for pound of TNT on all of Japan during the entire and their territories during the entirety of World War II in a tiny country, and like you know, Americans are told like the North Koreans like. I guess like want to invade us in like the Red Dawn remake or something like that. And mm. it's like, well, why would they want nuclear weapons? Like, because we've been menacing them for 60 years and we bombed them back to the stone age essentially. But if you don't understand the history, the, the propaganda machine is able to say, you need to hate North Korea and North Korea. They're, they're crazy. They're nuts. They want a nuclear weapon because they're crazy. They want to bomb Kansas. Like, no, they want to protect themselves from us. Like to understand Putin, um, like, why are the Russians, you know, uh, Russian elections are not perhaps the most open. Well, I'll, just, I'll just say that. But like, why does a huge percentage of Russians want Vladimir Putin as a strong man as their president? Because they lived through the 90s where like women with master's degrees were prostituting themselves so they could feed their children bread. Because like, we pushed the destruction of their country and we made the Soviet Union a promise we wouldn't extend NATO. And then we're putting missile bases in Romania and Poland. Like, if you don't understand history and geopolitics, the world can seem like a very scary place that just people hate you for no reason. Like, oh, they hate us for our freedom. Like, no, they don't. No, no, we don't have any freedom, first of all. Um, <laughs> but second of all, they don't hate us for our freedom. They they hate the oligarchs that push ge geopolitics. And and we're, we're a bunch of dupes because, it, you know, the information's out there. But people aren't informed and corporate news tells them one thing. And so that's how I think they get us. They, they trick us into supporting these uh, neoliberal policies and yeah. people die and it's people need to be educated. And if they're not, um, the system is just going to be allowed to continue. Education is the most important thing we can do. Yeah. Here, here. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Make, uh, no, I love that <laughs> education. You know, because like you're saying about people saying, "I want to do something," and you're say, saying, "Well, education and and campaigning and building the party and that sort of thing." That is doing something, and that is uh, absolutely the case. I don't think we have any possibility of moving anywhere forward until we understand uh, where we are. You have to be able to see around you, and in order to see around you, the world is a more than a three-dimensional phenomenon it exists in the fourth dimension as well you have to understand the past yeah i agree um what uh what do you think is going to happen oh in the next week in this <laughs> country uh i mean i think the democrats might push for article 25 um this week um and honestly i wouldn't be opposed because i would not be surprised if donald trump uh launched an illegal war uh on iran um, as a final, you know, middle finger to the system or, or something like that. I, I don't think he's in a good place. Uh, I don't think he's ever been really in a good place, but I think he's in a very dangerous situation, um, not just for our country, but for all the, the peoples of the world. Um, so I really hope the Democrats are able to do that, but American government only moves quickly uh, when we're authorizing an $800 billion military budget uh, or doing uh, illegal wars. So I don't know how fast parliamentary uh, procedures will, will move. <laughs> mm. So fingers and crossed. What do you think? I mean, that's interesting that you say fingers crossed because I always, I, I always refer to the Democrats as the delivery mechanism for fascism <laughs> because they are. But um, I mean, but yeah, maybe better than World War Three if if uh, if that's the uh, you know if those are the options. Biden reminds me of like a high school vice principal trying to like take care of like a, a riot in New York City or something. <laughs> like it's just completely over his head, you know. 
Well, and but, it's, it's dangerous. Like the, the Democrats, the fact we can't even get a vote for Medicare for all. Um, and now um, uh, Mnuchin in West Virginia is saying he's going to stand in the way. Like everyone was promised if the Dems get the Senate, we're going to get the $2,000 relief checks. It's going to be the first thing on the agenda. And now they've got, you know, the heel. You know, it's just like a, in professional wrestling. Uh, you know, the, the one guy has got to be the heel and uh, Mitch McConnell will get his way, even though the Democrats have the majority in the Senate um, because they don't want to help working people. Like our slavery is good for them. It's good for business that local businesses are closing. It's good that people are desperate because desperate workers don't organize. Desperate workers are thankful they still have a job no matter how bad it is and how low they're paid. And like this is this is beneficial for them. So like yeah, the the Democrats aren't aren't good people. <laughs> you know, I, I, the Republicans are, are corporate whores, but uh, you know, so, so are the Democrats. Yeah. In fact, the average, at least this is a couple years old, so I, I'm not sure if it's current, but the average Democrat in the Congress overall wealth is $4,000 greater than the average Republican. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Ma Matthew, what do you think the um, white nationalist movement might do in the next week? Uh, pretty much nothing. Um, and, and that's actually an interesting thing. Um, for all the people that were at the Capitol, um, there was only, well, Nick Fuentes, uh, who runs America First. Um, he's he's Hispanic. Uh, his whole thing is, I mean, he, he dog whistles a lot of white nationalism, but his whole thing is America First, like a very bizarre sort of hybrid creature, like Frankenstein monster. Um, and also the head of the Proud Boys is a Canadian uh, Latino, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so like there's, th there's this interesting thing because um, white nationalism uh, in general, I mean, I, I stay up with things. Um, really, like I publicly turned my back on Trump in 2017 um, after his strike on Syria, because at that point I knew he wasn't a non-interventionist. Mm -hmm. And if all of his... If, As if that was claimed to be. Yeah. yeah. So if he's going to lie about that, he's going to lie about anything. Um, so a lot of white nationalists, like, I mean, Joe, uh, uh, Richard Spencer voted for Joe Biden, um, like non unironically, there's a, a consensus, at least amongst the former alt-right from what I've seen that, uh, the Democrats, um, you know, pushing for, for non-racial issues such as universal basic income, universal health care is the best way, um, to help white people because white people will also get those things versus we get absolutely nothing with the Republicans. Um, that's not to say that that's what the accelerationists are doing. Um, and then you've got this, what we call the American nationalist or the civic nationalists that are like the MAGA types. They could be dangerous. Like, I think we have a whole lot more to worry about in this country um, from like one of the local Georgia 3% militias is multiracial. They're in like a vice documentary. Um, and like their leader is relatively unhinged from every public thing I've seen. Um, I don't think we have really to worry um, about like the white nationalist movement in general, I think the Patriot movement is far more dangerous. And like, you look at Timothy McVeigh with Oklahoma City, like he uh, flirted with white nationalism, um, but he was he was deep into the militia subculture. Um, I think the militias, because the thing about a lot of white nationalists is they, they acknowledge that America is, is a non-viable entity, that this is an empire that's going to collapse in some way, shape or form. And, you know, an ethno state or a homeland could be created out of that. Uh, the whole like we're going to fist fight the federal government ended up with everyone being arrested in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and the skinhead subculture doesn't exist anymore uh, for the most part. So most people are a little brainier um, and are kind of just waiting for the collapse in a lot of ways. Uh, but the patriots um, like listening to Kelly Loeffler's ads and stuff where like we must stop socialism or the republic is going to die. Like, right. It, they believe that the election was stolen. The Biden administration is totally illegitimate. Their voices aren't being heard because the votes aren't being counted. And like communism, but not real communism, like Ronald Reagan, 1980s, hide under your desk, the spooky communism that America teaches us about, uh, like eating, having to eat your dog because there's no food or something um, is coming. So honestly, I think in terms of looking forward uh, for the foreseeable future, the, the biggest danger is is the patriot movement um, and conservatives, on, honestly, like, yeah. in general. And Kelly LaFleur and her and the other wing nut uh, in Georgia, they spent half a billion dollars on, on their, I think it was, on their campaigning. And that's, uh, and it, it can only imagine how much TV advertising uh, that bought for <laughs> folks yeah. to be listening to. Last question, Matthew. Um, as you uh, just got um, exposed for having been in D.C. when you weren't in D.C. on a bunch of very major national 
networks uh, in, in the past couple of days. Um, and you're expecting possibly that if you're recognized at work, you may get fired tomorrow. Yeah. Um, what would you uh, say to your boss if you if if your boss actually was interested in communication? Well, I, I mean, what I'd say to my boss is, um, you know, am I am I a good worker? Um, you know, are the the things I'm being accused of? Um, did I do them? No. Uh, of course, the history aspect comes up, and I'd say, well, is are my beliefs different now? And the answer is yes. Unfortunately, I live in a right to work state. Um, we're like when our local um, Volkswagen uh, tried to unionize for the second time last last year, a year before that, or something like that, and the governor came to denounce it, and the company flew all these people in from Germany and stuff like that, which is ironic, of course, that Volkswagen prides itself as having uh, good union jobs for everyone around the world, especially in Germany, um, but they set up a plant here in Tennessee uh, so they could use you know poor, desperate labor and pay uh, far smaller wages than they do anywhere else in the world. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, our governor, of course, uh, hates the idea of unions. Uh, you know, there are billboards everywhere, radio ads, and all sorts of stuff, and um, we don't have any worker protections uh, in effect in this state. So um, what I'd like to say is uh, please don't fire me because I have kids and a wife and uh, bills to pay. But uh, what I'll probably say is, uh, you know, here's my here's my key card because um, <laughs> mm. there, there, there's no recourse. And that's the, the gutting of the labor laws. Like in a lot of ways, uh, Appalachia has become a place for uh, companies that started to build plants. You know, they, they have a, a car plant uh, in uh, South Carolina they built kind of recently, one in Alabama. Um, and other manufacturing around because we, we have piss poor labor laws. We have no unions. Um, actually, a funny story. So two years ago, I wanted to see what our local Democratic Party's organization was. Um, I was living in a rural county um, near uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, and uh, they didn't have, even have enough people to man all of the officer positions for that they were mandated by their bylaws. Like there, there was no Democratic Party. It, doesn't exist. And if there's no Democratic Party, there sure isn't going to be like far left organization. So like, I mean, basically, we have no recourse of any kind. Um, so, you know, it's if I lose my job tomorrow off something I didn't do because I hit the media, it wouldn't be the first time. Um, but it is a little tiresome is like, as I'm out of the movement, and I'm trying to do something different, and I'm trying to build connections and bridges with, with members of my community, outside of what I've done for the last 10 years it it's hard to do um and by your community you mean your community geographically in the area where you yeah. live yeah. yeah and just for the record you you would describe yourself explicitly as anti-racist yeah yeah because racism um when you understand it is is the dislike or hatred of other people for how they were born and things like that like i feel like i can have an affinity um, for my culture and my heritage and stuff like that. Um, but in terms of disliking or mistreating or having a lack of solidarity with people of other races or religions, uh, yeah, I, I, by that definition, yeah, I'm anti-racist. Mm -hmm. Just, just. I mean, I know I described you as that before. I just wanted to get it out of the horse's mouth. Matthew, thank you so much. This has been such a fascinating conversation. I'd really like to talk another two hours, but I think nobody's going to want to listen for more than two hours. Well, I appreciate it, David. And thank you just for the impact you've had on me, like for my entire not even adult life, but, but longer than that. Uh, the work that your music does, uh, trust me, there were a lot of fascists who traveled in my car that listen to your music for hours upon hours, going from rally to rally, and they, they were forced to because it was my car, damn it. <laughs> what did they think of it, though? I mean, what did they think of it? There, there's, there's songs that they might have, uh, I mean, I can imagine a lot of songs that, that they wouldn't be offended by and might learn things about history and whatever else, but then wouldn't there be other songs that they'd find uh, terribly offensive? Yeah, but it was my car and I was the boss, so they had to listen to it. Um. <laughs> do, do you remember? Do you remember any particular songs they liked and didn't like in particular on on the <laughs> extreme ends of like or dislike? Sure. Um, well, I can think of one that that had a strong emotional impact um, on guys when we were because we used to drive. I had a Toyota Corolla that. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah, it, it hit three hundred thousand miles and the odometer broke. Um, <laughs> 
and that's it, when you know it's ready to go another hundred thousand. It, it kept rolling. I I drove that thing from coast to coast, north to south, to because I can never afford to fly. Um, mm-hmm. so it was just driving to rallies and driving to rallies, sleeping on our car. It was horrible. Um, mm-hmm. But um, in terms of one that I can really think of um, that had like an emotional positive impact was uh, Janine, because um, like that that song is haunting. Um, and another one that I can think of had a, um, a positive impact was uh, was Fallujah. Because, from, especially from a patriotic perspective, like if you're a nationalist, the mm-hmm. idea of, of Iraqis shooting at Blackhawks and to defend their, their land, right? Like mm-hmm. that's all the lines in the song. Mm-hmm. Um, like when you put it in that perspective, like, yeah, I would do the same thing. And then like, oh man, the war in Iraq is bullshit. <laughs> you know, like... Um, right. The the one I can think that they would hate the most is uh, Henry Ford is a fascist, uh, but that's just a, such a, such a fun peppy song. Uh, you know you can't you, you can't cut it out. So <laughs> classic. No, and, and, and like and, and that was the thing. And most of those guys, like I can think of, um, are out of the movement in one way or another. And there's a there's a lot of folks. Um, I guess it's like a final message. Like mm. there's a lot of folks that have a lot of political experience. Like it, people who are watching, like. Maybe you threw things at us, like maybe we said not nice things to you or you know, whatever over the years. But there's a lot of people that have come to the same realization that like we're in this together and we're waiting to be allowed to be a part of something. Like I don't I don't expect any one of your viewers to trust me or to like me, but I want the opportunity to do good work because mm-hmm. any, anyone can say anything but actions speak far louder than words. Like I can say all day, I believe this, or I want to do this. But like for me, I've spent the last year not having the opportunity really to get involved in some capacity to, to prove that this is where I stand and this is what I believe in. And this is the future I want to build for my two children. Um, and there's a lot of people like me that were involved in some capacity in the far right. Like the turnover rate in my experience is 18 months that if you, True believers stay longer, but the average person comes in with a year and a half, will find their way out for one reason or another. There's a lot of us out there. Which doesn't mean that they want to necessarily go join Antifa and start attacking anybody they see uh, who has a, uh, who looks like a member of the far right. Uh, right. <laughs> which, 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 and not wanting to join Antifa is not, uh, doesn't mean you're uh, a fascist, right? right. I mean, it's just... <laughs> Just to clarify. It, it, it's not the one or the other. So, like, but it's hard to kind of. So then, how is it that you can actually uh, have uh, some level of acceptance as somebody who leaves uh, a movement? I mean, we hear about people who have uh, fascist uh, tattoos that they want to get uh, uh, removed, and and that's like, I mean, but like, what? Which is okay. That's a physical manifestation. Okay, I understand this. This is a nice story. You know, it's always nice to interview a good tattoo artist. They're often colorful people but uh this is not i mean are there other what there's no process here right i mean and and then when you express uh remorse for having had uh some uh, regrettable views or for having uh done uh, regrettable things uh, at what point is it, it, it do people take you seriously and, and and then of course once you are leaving the movement and trying to do something uh, productive and realizing in, in very uh, clearly, articulately, uh, you know, you you understand what you're doing. You're, this is not just a random. You're not like Mr. Magoo wandering around and you know, like oh here's another. T- let's see, let's join the Marxist Leninists. You know, oh there's one. Oh yeah, he looks nice. You know, I mean, this is a well thought out uh, process. But uh, like yeah, what point does it become something that people can? I don't know. Other than. Well- well, I'll say this. Um, I have the only thing I have been able to do uh, successfully since leaving the movement is double the amount of death threats I've gotten. So that's been that's been. Oh, exciting. so now you get death threats from the right and the left, right? Oh, excellent. Because <laughs> le- le- leftists say you're still a crypto fascist and being a, a Marxist Leninist, uh, you're a tanky, you're a Stalinist. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So you need to crush those people. <laughs> so they're they're still mad. Uh, but on the other side, I'm a race trader that needs to be hung on the day of the rope uh, for my betrayal of uh, Aryan virtue and whatnot and so forth. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I have successfully doubled the amount of hate mail, um, excellent, well which done. is great. Uh, but I do hope uh, for anyone watching and things like that, and you know, I want us to stay in touch. Um, mm. I'd like to find and you know, folks that I've 
I've helped and through their own process have gotten out. I want to find a way to be able to engage in a working class movement to advance the betterment of all of us. Um, and so if anyone wants, they can they can drop me a line. You know, my, my phone numbers and email have been doxxed for like 10 years. So I, I refuse to change them. <laughs> Easy to find. <laughs> Easy to find. <laughs> I have gotten so many, um, uh, well, death threats online, but then in terms of uh, the, the harassing phone calls, there's this one lunatic who calls me and yells at me about not believing that 9-11 was an inside job, uh, and um, or at least not believing that Cheney lined the buildings with explosives. And I certainly <laughs> believe that the U.S. Uh, you know, helped form and, and, and fund Al-Qaeda. That's another question. But... Right. <laughs> The, uh, but uh, this guy only calls up to yell at me during business hours. Do you, Classic. Do you, of course, you can turn your phone off, but I never even have to. I mean, I hope this isn't going to encourage too many people to call me in the middle of the night. But do you, when, when people call you up, do they do it during business hours or at all random hours? Or does that not happen too much? All random hours. Uh, I will say my favorite calls are, uh, I've had this like two or three times, where uh, uh, anti-fascists, like after a rally, are together and celebrating and inebriated, uh, uh, call me up and uh, leave me a nice voicemail. Those are those are always the fun ones. Uh, the people that are like, "I'm gonna murder your family, uh, you fascist blankety blankety blank," not so nice. Or the other one now, um, "I'm gonna kill your family, you anti-fascist blankety blankety blank." Oh wow! <laughs> but it's it, it's fine. Like I don't knock on wood, but no one's killed me yet. Um, mm. So or hopefully, your family. But they actually do talk about that, yeah, not just it, killing you, but your family, because what they're uh, they're being raised by uh, somebody bad, so they must be turning out to be bad, so it's, uh, we can kill them first. Now, little fascists yeah. grow up to be big fascists. I actually mm -hmm. um, had uh, for Valentine's Day a uh, hand cut out card. No, I'll be quiet after a sec. Of uh, skull and mm -hmm. crossbones with glitter. Um, that uh, that was a death threat, which uh, I appreciate the artistic ingenuity for it. Uh, but it was mailed to my front door. Um, and like I put it on my table and my son, uh, who was like three at the time, uh, picked it up and was like, dad, someone sent us something. And mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. yeah. And I went to the local cops and they were like, well, I think it's the mail. That's a federal issue. And I was like, okay, well, it's not going to go anywhere. You know, after, after you report the first couple death threats and nothing happens, you just kind of, it goes with the territory. Um, but you know, it's, it's hard. It's exhausting. Um, like I became an alcoholic um, <laughs> because of it, but luckily I got into AA um, mm. you know, two and a half years ago and it saved my life, but mm. um, it's hard. But anyway, hopefully we can all make friends and carry on together because we're all locked in this sinking ship and uh, all of us have to get off or none of us get off. Like, Sorry. That's but... how it is. That's how it is. We actually are all in the same planet together, whether or not we're in uh, any other thing together. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, it's been great pleasure talking to you. Well, and, thank you so uh, much. Thank you. <laughs> solidarity. I'll just uh, solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do a little outro. I'll be back in a minute. And uh, thanks for tuning into this conversation with Matthew Heimbach, a founder of the Traditionalist Workers Party and ex-white nationalist. And um, we will see you again soon. Remember, mutual aid will get us through. Don't pay the rent. Trust your neighbors. Bye for now.